You know, they say a woman's place is in the home, and uh, I suppose as long as she's in the home, she might as well be in the kitchen. What is indecision costing you? You know, when you open yourself up to doubt, you activate the wrong power. And the book of James says, when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the, of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. We have not because we ask not, and we ask not because we're not all in. 10 minutes of despair will impair you for 10 hours. And we start obsessively problem solving. Well, what else could I do? What other options do I have? Was this whole Mary Kay thing just the Mary Kay car wash shining me up and prepping me for something else? Millennials, you need to know we have a name for that. It's called the shiny penny syndrome. And it doesn't, it doesn't even look good on paper because the reality is the vices that plague you here will follow you there. In 1941, men in the United States left their jobs to go fight in World War II, which caused a major labor shortage. So who took over? Women. Women left their homes and worked in factories, and because of that, we have icons like Rosie the Riveter. In the 1950s and into the 60s and 70s, a new propaganda was being pushed. A narrative that told women to ditch their overalls and get back in the kitchen where they belong. On average, women spent three hours per day preparing and cooking meals for their families in the 1950s. Because of this, there was great innovation and technology that was home-focused to relieve some of the burden for homemakers and convince them to stay in the home, such as the first affordable dishwasher in 1950, saran wrap in 1953, and the first home microwave in 1955, to name a few. TV dinners and the first colored kitchen appliances were also thrown in during that decade, but no matter how much you decorate a kitchen or innovate for the home, some things just can't be put back in their box. It's no wonder the women's liberation movement started in the 1960s. Women wanted to work and demanded equal pay. The audacity. Aretha was singing about R-E-S-P-E-C-T, women were wearing miniskirts and marching in the streets, and a 45-year-old top saleswoman in Texas was tired of training men who later became her superiors. So she decided to quit and launch a cosmetics company in 1963. Her name was Mary Kay Ash. Mary Kay wasn't afraid of hard work, and she knew women weren't afraid of hard work either. She believed many women not only wanted to get out of the house and work, but to be recognized for their efforts. She awarded her cosmetic sellers with crowns, sashes, golden goblets, and casserole dishes. Until one day, Mary Kay Ash decided she wanted a pink Cadillac for herself. She pulled up to her company with a custom paint job, and everyone inside wanted a pink Cadillac too. And that's how this multi-level marketing company's biggest recruitment tool was born. Mary Kay started awarding all of her top sellers, known as national sales directors, with pink Cadillacs. Later on, Mary Kay Ash took the company public, debuting on the New York Stock Exchange. But only a few short years later, she begrudgingly bought back every share so she could make her own decisions and not have to pander to its shareholders, aka men. By 2018, Mary Kay was labeled as the sixth largest network marketing company in the world. Mary Kay Ash was an icon of her time, a working woman who knew what she wanted and wasn't afraid to go after it. But if Mary Kay Ash was alive today, I wonder how she'd feel knowing that according to truthinadvertising.org, there are only 1,000 Mary Kay pink Cadillacs on the road today. I wonder how she'd feel knowing that according to the Mary Kay Cosmetics Income Disclosure Statement on their website for their Canadian distributors, 83% earn $0 in bonuses and commissions. How does one earn bonuses and commissions? By building a team through recruitment. That means 83% of Mary Kay's Canadian distributors have never been able to recruit a single person. And we all know, in multi-level marketing, recruitment is where the real money comes from. Let's take a look at the top 1% of Mary Kay's Canadian distributors who have been in, on average, of four years. They earn, on average, only $20,000 a year from building a team. And all these numbers are before taxes or other business-related expenses. 
But the most shocking thing to me of all is that while I was doing research for this video, I learned Mary Kay Cosmetics doesn't even provide an income disclosure statement for their United States distributors. If that's not the biggest red flag, I don't know what is. And it makes me wonder what they're allegedly hiding. Are you a feminist? You believe so much in women and the cause of women. That seems by definition to make you a feminist. I guess I'm right in the middle. I want women to have their cake and eat it too. Although Mary Kay seemed ahead of her time, she had some thoughts on how women should look and act. Thoughts that turned into rules for her company that still continue to this day. So the big question is why do they not let y'all wear pants? Not professional. I don't, you, haven't you noticed how women don't look professional in pants? <laughs> Today, I'm interviewing a former Canadian Mary Kay sales director, and she's spilling everything about how she got close to the top, how she got in $60,000 of debt climbing that Mary Kay mountain, and why she finally walked away. We'll call her Elle. This is her story, as told to me. Welcome to the channel, Elle. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy I'm really, to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you. Um, and I know that you have your own YouTube channel. And later, if you'd like, we can share that. Um, I, that. I really want to get to know, which by the way, you have a beautiful voice. I listened to a couple Thank videos you. on your channel. Um, I know in your email, when you emailed me, you said that you were part of Mary Kay. And you had... Was you had been with Mary Kay for like five years and it was your full-time job mm -hmm. and you earned the car. I did. And I'm looking at it right now. And then there was like a downfall, which I completely understand. So yeah. I would first love if you could tell me and my listeners how you got started in Mary Kay. Like how mm -hmm. did it all happen in the beginning? What, what, what really like drove you to it? And yeah. tell us about like the rise. Okay, so I signed my consultant agreement in April of 2015. So this would be, I'd like be six years in if I was still there. Um, but I've been out for about a year, so five years. Anyway, sorry. So I, yeah, I started in April 2015. I finished my university degree, um, actually finished it in the fall. I took a couple summer classes and finished then. So I finished in like September of 2014. So, and I think that's like important because there was like that gap of like being done my degree, but then not having a job uh, and, and wanting to do uh, something. At the time, I thought I wanted to do something with marketing. So I got an English degree. And at the time, my kind of like dream job was I really wanted to be a copywriter, like writing, ad, like writing copy for advertisers. Um, I had a friend who had the same degree as me. She used to be like a journalist and like that was kind of her career path. And I followed it and I, like I had been watching her with her career while I was doing the same discipline. And so I guess she was like an inspiration to me. I wanted to do this marketing thing. Um, I got my degree. I applied at every ad company in the city and I got like other, I was basically like told like call, come back when you have three years of experience, which is yeah, like every, you know, like new college grads experience where you're like, great. I can't wait to come back in three years with this magical experience that I can't find anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was kind of like there just in that, like, I don't know what to do. And I had a good friend, like one of my closer friends who had started in Mary Kay in December of that year. So I finished my degree in September. She started in December and I saw, I'd been seeing her like posting on Facebook, you know, about like how great she was doing and looking for people to interview. And I hadn't seen this friend for a couple of years. And so I was wanting to, um, like catch up anyway. And so I saw that she had posted, like, it's so bad that I'm telling you this because this is like why it works. Cause people like literally fall for this. And I, I can't believe it because I was pretty anti MLM before I signed up, but I had this friend, she was a really good friend of mine. And, uh, she, I'd seen her posting on Facebook that she was looking for interviewers or, you know, borrowing people's faces, whatever. And so in my mind, I was like, Oh, I, this will be like a great, 
opportunity to catch up with her, have coffee, see what's what, see how she likes this Mary Kay thing. And that was really, I guess I had been thinking of maybe doing like a direct seller just for myself. I was thinking maybe like Steeps Tea or one of the tea companies, but mostly just because I wanted like some discounted tea for myself. So I guess I was like, maybe like a little MLM curious when I went to that interview, but I was like not very thinking that I was going to sign right up. But then at the end of the coffee, I was just like, it made so much sense to me. Um, and I thought to myself, like, well, if I could like build my own business and if I could get myself to the point where I'm like in a car or like where I'm doing really well, then that would look great on a resume, which just makes me laugh now because trying to apply for jobs, like as if I would be like, yeah, I was definitely an MLM for five years, hire me so I can harass your staff. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's so hard to know what to do once you leave an MLM after so many years, because I have a blank spot on my resume. I have experience that I think is great, but you have to like meet the person before you know like where they're at with all that so I don't it's just so funny to me looking back that like I really thought that this MLM experience was gonna like pivot me into the career of my dreams well and um, you're told that they always say sure. this will be the vehicle to get you to where you want to exactly. go exactly exactly so I was thinking like I want to be in marketing I'll market this product uh I'm you know I'm a good writer I'll learn about social media I'll you know have this marketing experience and that'll be great and so I signed up in April and I started with some inventory. I invested about $3,000 in inventory right away. Um, you know, and did she, like you said, sell from an empty wagon. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah, the empty wagon thing. Yeah, you yeah, can't yeah, sell yeah. from an empty wagon. You said that she, you met her for coffee and you called it an interview. Did she tell you it would be an interview? Um, we, she would have called it probably just going for coffee, like going for coffee to f learn more about what I do. It's probably okay. what, like, I ask, phrasing. I ask because I know there are a lot of MLMs who target college students or new mm -hmm. grads and they'll say things like, oh yeah, this is an interview for a job. And it's completely misleading. It's a complete lie. Yeah. Um, with the $3,000, I remember getting hounded by a Mary Kay consultant to join. And I just remember being like, three thousand dollars is like that is so much money i didn't even have that at the time i was like what in the world and i remember i, I try to like obviously i've worked in customer service anyone who's worked in customer service you know you just know how it is and you go out of your way to be kind to people but i remember this mary Kay woman she would not quit calling me and she was like i've already earned the car you know i have a bachelor's and this and this but she's like it, it's this is so much better and i don't even use that anymore and you know what's stopping you from starting today and i said you know i'm really just well, not that's right now. i'm not available and she was like but what's stopping you and i had i find Finally, she would so not many quit. Reasons. Yeah, she yeah. wouldn't quit. I had to be like, don't call me again. <laughs> and Literally, I just, leave me alone. I hated being mean, but I had to get I'm off. Happy. I just was like, I don't want to talk to you. So that $3,000, how did you feel spending that amount? Did you freak out or were you told like, this will be worth it? It's a great investment. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was told it would be worth it. It was a great investment. Um, so yeah, no, I didn't bat an eye on that. I, I was like, yeah, absolutely. Let's for sure do this. Um, <laughs> So, so to explain why, why would you think that? Um, well, okay. So the person who recruited me, like she was a friend. So I think she was like in her red jacket, which is three recruits. I think I maybe made her a red jacket. So she was like, and red jacket is considered like the top 4%. That's what they tell you. Oh, yeah. With okay. three team members, you're in the top 4%. Okay. <laughs> okay. That like really goes to show you how many people are building teams and earning cars, but as that's just an aside, uh, so she became a red jacket when I signed, I think. So she only had like three team members, but she had started with like what we would call the minimum star order, which was like an 1800 would have come to around 2000. So she had started, like my recruiter had started with inventory. And so when the inventory discussion came up, like right away, she was like, you know, I started with 1800. I sold it immediately. I wished I started with more. And so I was like, oh, well then I should definitely start with more. And so the brackets go up by $600 increments. Like I started with a 2400, but then by the time you put in the taxes, which is like, you know, and like the shipping and all of it, it's like closer to three grand, right? Because of all of the extra, you know, That's surprise charges and the, and the sales supplies and the beauty code and the like, whatever the other like dumb stuff was that they thought I needed to sell this product. Uh, it was probably like around three grand. So or like, yeah, around there. Uh, she had started with around that. So and encouraged me to start with more. So that seemed normal to me. My, our director, so you know, yeah, you get it. So our director, she probably was working with like 
$10,000 wholesale on her shelf. Like I would bet I saw her inventory. Like, so it was like very, very much normal to me. I was like, Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I'm going to be shoppers drug mart. Like for sure. You know, I, like I really, that was like, I came into an area that was like very much about inventory, very much about working from a full store, very much about profit level inventory. Um, my recruiter was in a pink car, uh, and her mom was in a pink Escalade and she was our national sales director. She was like the number three person in our entire country. So like, there was never a doubt in my mind. I was like, oh yes, absolutely. Let me like hitch my wagon to the star and like ride it to success. You know, uh, I was like, I never, I never, like, this was what all the people around me were doing. This is what I, you know, saw successful people doing. This is what I thought was going to uh, accelerate my success because I wouldn't always be waiting for inventory. I wouldn't always be um, not having things on hand that people want to check out. You know, like I, the eye sees what the eye buys. Like I was very um, convinced that having inventory on my shelf was a good plan. And it, it seemed like a good plan for quite a while. Like I have way more than $3,000 on my shelf now. Is that all uh, Mary Kay behind you? That's all Mary Kay behind me. Yeah. <sighs> Wow. Yeah. Okay. I didn't realize yeah. I saw that, but I didn't realize it was Mary Kay. Actually, if you look at that like black insulated thing, oh yeah. That's two thousand dollars worth of lipsticks. That's like like what I will sell them for. They should be it should be like forty five hundred dollars worth of lipsticks, but like to me it's gonna be two thousand dollars worth of lipsticks. And are you able to send that back? No. no <gasps> that is shoveling her out the door, twenty dollars at a time, just selling it all. <laughs> wow unbelievable yeah, been, and like, what's the reason time. you can't send it back if it's never been opened and it's it's not you know several years old okay so i have thought about this a little bit the whole return policy is like a total farce for anyone who's been in the business for a while and i mean i guess like the idea is you've learned enough that you should know or whatever you can only return product that you've ordered within the last 12 months so it you you have to, so i was in for like five years right so I could only send back like my last 12 months worth. Well, I made my last order in July of 2019. I stepped down as a director in December of 2019. And then I still had like all this on my shelf. And like at that time, like I didn't step down and be like, to heck with Mary Kay, I'm done and all of it. Like I intended to service my customer base. I thought that I would probably, you know, maintain my consultant status. Like at that point I had invested so much of my time and resources, like personal energy into like establishing this customer base that I thought, why would I like give that up? So I had no intention to quit selling the product or anything like that, but I had so much product on hand that it's not like I needed to order it. I was also like massively depressed and in like a terrible space when I stepped down. So I was like not working. Uh, and there's like some other like really unfortunate personal details that like intersect with the Mary Kay. It's like, it, well, it's all Mary Kay. Like, it's all like my whole life unraveled and this is basically why. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I wasn't, like when I stepped down as a director, I wasn't like, yeah, I'm done forever. So it was like a long, long time before I knew that I was never gonna wanna be a consultant again, that I was never gonna wanna be a part of the company, that I was not gonna service the customer base that I had. And once you send product back, like you can never be a consultant again, you can never order, you're just like done forever. Oh yeah, what? if you send your product back, you're done forever, absolutely. So they, they guilt you into oh, yeah, not yeah, yeah. sending back product just yeah, yeah. so that they can keep stringing you along with the dream of being able yeah, to yeah. rejoin or reach that dream again. Because if you send back product, you're, you're screwed. You can never do anything with them again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh no, that's fair. It makes me think of what is that like Disney movie where they're like, now you can never go back. That's like what it's like. If you send your inventory <laughs> back, you can never go back. <laughs> I don't know what Disney movie that is, but that's great. Oh my gosh. What, how much product like inventory, like in dollars wise, how, how much do you think you have on hand? Total estimate. Okay. Um, what I'm hoping I'd say about 6,000 is what I still have on hand. I paid more than that for it, but that would like recently I kind of took the like, okay, so if I keep selling this at what I'm selling it at, which is like just about just under my cost, it's probably like 10% less than my cost or something. So like I am losing money on the, all the product I'm selling, but like, I don't care, like get it out of my house. Mm -hmm. Also, honestly, I have so much product that like, I don't need to, 
Well, I mean, it would be like awesome to pay off my loans and like be debt free, but like, that's, that's not the dream that we're chasing. We're just trying to get it out of our house, get as much money for it as I can. Pay off your uh, student actual, loans or loans that you took out for Mary Kay? Loans that I took out for Mary Kay. Oh yeah. I just oh. have all kinds of credit cards, all the credit cards, all the oh. consolidation loans. It's a second mortgage. It's a real second mortgage. <laughs> oh no. Okay. We're, like I'm getting there. Like I'm paying it off. I know. I know. Yeah. I get it. What it's so a lot you better than it was building, here, You were building this and you started off and you were excited. And how yeah. was it going in the beginning? And you were charging it to credit cards, I assume. Did they urge that? Yeah. Um, okay, so at first, okay, and then sorry, another little like I'm like not answering any of your questions fully. I apologize. Oh, okay. Another thing that I think made me not think much of the amount of money that I was investing, and this is just like foolishness on my part, like everyone learn from me, please. <laughs> but I grew up on a cattle ranch. And so like when I call home, my mom's like, yeah, like we just had the trailer in the shop and it cost us six grand to fix the hitch. Like, you know, I grew up like where, like, in, like, but what I now realize is, you know, when I look at like, you know, profit and loss, I'm like, oh, but real businesses make money. And that's the freaking difference. They don't just only spend money. And I guess like, I mean, part of it probably just growing up on a ranch, like you just always hear your parents like complaining about the expenses and you don't really hear them being like, hooray, we sold the steers, we can pay the bill. You know, like who talks about that? That's like not in our culture. So I just like heard a lot about, and I think that that's part of what like sucked me into to like that toxic positivity culture. Because I was suddenly like, instead of being surrounded by like people talking about real world problems, I was talking, I was surrounded by people talking about how much money they were making. Well, right? and, and like you are only allowed to focus on exactly. the positive and the good things and not even the news. And I come from oh, a small not town in Missouri and oh. yeah, farm equipment is expensive. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you, you know, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, you know, just even not being able to like focus on the news or talk about world events that are actually happening, it's not mm -hmm. real life. And it gets nope. you in this brainwashed yes. bubble that things should yes. only be positive and happy at all times. Yeah. And I think that that was part of what drew me in. But yeah, like I, I know when I say these numbers, like, yeah, I spent like $3,000 or like I had all these credit cards racked up, but like, I just, I don't know. I grew up hearing all these like large number expenses. So, and I was like, I guess that's just how real businesses are. Now, obviously one thing that I really realized with like some reflection, especially when I like now look at my income taxes with a clear mind, uh, I, this has been such a lesson for me, honestly, about like money. Cause I, I like have never been very, I'm not bad with money. I'm really good at saving money. I just, money means nothing to me. Like, it's just, it's such a meaningless resource to me. Like I care about time. I care about memories. I care so you're about- you're not motivated by money is what you mean. Yeah. So I think that like the fact that I was like in all this debt, like I was so like wrapped up in like where I thought I was going and in like living in my vision instead of my circumstance. Like I just, the way that my brain is wired, it was so easy for me to be like, I'm living in my vision, not my circumstances. And so like, let me just continue to like charge this to my card because, oh, because my past doesn't equal my future. So just cause I'm like bleeding all this money and in on so much debt right now, like doesn't mean tomorrow will be like that. So I better just keep going. And, uh, oh, you, you know, you don't want to give up when you're three feet from gold. Did you hear that about like the diamond, yeah. the gold miner, right? And then he quits and then it turns out that he was right there. And if he had just kept going, he'd have hit gold, you know, so I didn't want to be that guy. So I just kept investing in my gold mine, like so sure. <laughs> like one day I was going to like find a vein of gold and like, really actually pay off all that debt and like really actually uh be as successful as i was pretending that i was like i really but you didn't go it's important like yes we have to take responsibility for our actions but there's also a lot of undue influence that goes on mm -hmm. in mlm because you yeah. didn't go into it with that mindset you were even <laughs> skeptical of mlms that mindset everything yeah. you just said is what's preached it's like the prosperity yeah. gospel and Absolutely. well you gotta give money to make money and like you said you gotta live in your vision and not your circumstance you're not 100 percent in you're 100 percent out and you it's can't complete. be all in if you're not like investing all your money like <laughs> it's complete delusions yes. that these people have and they brainwash others with it yeah and realize that i was surrounded by people driving pink cars like my senior drove a pink car her senior drove a pink car their senior was our national their mom she drove a pink car this other girl drove a pink car this other girl drove like everybody was driving pink cars you know like i was like really in like the pink bubble. Like I just really, you know, believed and I, and you know, you're told these things like, just do what I, you know, just do what I do. Just do what I tell you and you'll be where I am. Just do, you know, just be a good 
like be a good learner, be a good follower. Good leaders make good followers. Good teachers make good learners, you know? And I was always praised for being so teachable and so open to learn. And now I'm just like, yeah, like so stupid, really. Like, honestly, <laughs> like, um, you're not stupid. So, and that's the thing. You were even college educated with a degree. Oh, did they love to parade me around? The, oh, of course degree. they did. Of like, course they did. I have did. an honors degree. Like, don't, like, they loved to parade me, all of us around with our degrees we weren't using. Exactly. Because it's yeah. a recruiting tool. And, Absolutely. And I mean, I'm really big on standing firm in the belief that, you know, that idea that dumb, ignorant people join cults and join these commercial cults that are MLMs is mm -hmm. a complete myth. Smart, educated people join yeah. MLM companies, these commercial yeah. cults. I saw lawyers. I saw mm -hmm. doctors join. I was just telling my husband the other day, I remember a doctor in my first company quit her practice to do the MLM full time. Mm -hmm. Really and believing. So yeah. You you were a smart person, but there's just no one knows everything that goes on underneath. Yeah. And I think that's why it's so important to me to like speak about it now. Like that's why I've come full circle and I'm like, yes, like I will tell everyone and use my face and don't like blur my voice. Because as far as I'm concerned, like my speaking ability in my mind were used as like a recruiting tool for four years. And I mean, obviously. I like I have I feel differently about it now than I did then at the time I thought I was like offering people this great opportunity and changing lives and empowering women and doing you know all the things I thought I was doing but now I realize that that was like not the case and it really makes me sad to wonder like how many people came to a guest event and signed up because I spoke how many people are I know that I know that there are people who are directors right now because of the trainings that I did like people told me like you know I listened to your zoom call every single morning when I was qualifying for director and it's like what got me through and now I think about that and I'm just like you know like the burden of guilt for me is so heavy and like yes I believed it more than anyone I like rip you know I spent more than anyone else in my unit on inventory I lost more than anyone else I know like it's you know what I mean like I, I don't want to claim a victim but like I am a victim like I'm I was not like out here trying to scam people on purpose absolutely not but I also realized that I was mistaken about some things <laughs> and it's just so important to me that I use like my face and my voice to also because like you said I think there's just this narrative that it's a lot of people who are you know desperate or aren't educated or and it's important that people see that like everyone anyone could get like duped into an MLM even someone who's like anti MLM could get like, I never thought that Mary Kay was an MLM. I never thought it was until I left. I thought it's direct sales. It's different. I had all these reasons why I believe that it was different. And that's why it's so important to me to name the company too. Because at first I didn't want to do that. Um, but like, I have to, because there's like people in Mary Kay who like really think they're going to turn it around. Like they really think it's different and they're going to be different and it's not going to be them. Uh, yeah. And they need to know that that's probably not true. <laughs> When you join, so you order your product, you get your product mm -hmm. and you're excited and you're obviously got into that, like all that toxic positivity. Cause I can, I, the phrases you're saying, I'm like, oh yeah, I, rec I remember that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All <laughs> so of them. I know they just come, it? they just come back. Yeah. So <laughs> how was it when you get in and you get your product, do you start selling and doing well and hitting ranks? Yeah. So I started selling and doing well right away. I, um, my, my mother, my mother-in-law had a get going into business party for me. Uh, and I think I retailed like around $500 from that class, which was actually like low average wise. Cause there was eight people there. And so, I mean, by the numbers, it wasn't a great class, but it was like a, such a great start for me and all people who had used Mary Kay before, like even my mother-in-law had been one actually at one point. And I actually think she 90 percent of her inventory because I could never convince her to sign. And I think that's probably why, uh, because she bought the product. She was really, you know, she supported me in every way she could uh or like that she felt like she like she supported me in every way she could just looking back you know you and I both know that the best way to support someone in an MLM is to not support someone in an MLM <laughs> yeah but uh she was doing her best as a mother-in-law and so my first class was really great and my inventory arrived I started with inventory before I ever had a class like I was like let me be like let me I was like I was in business like I was told, you know, people who are doing it full time or who are, you know, profit level inventory. And so like, I was there to like make money. I was running it like a business. Uh, I, I was treating it like a business and businesses take money and businesses need capital to start up. And so I like invested several thousand dollars and I thought that would be okay. My first week of working, I retailed a thousand, like I sold, I had a thousand dollar week, my very first week. And I was working like a million different part-time jobs. 
Uh, and I still, I was just like so determined. Like I remember looking back, like I was packaging up orders at like midnight in between like all my millions, like I had like three jobs plus the Mary Kay I was doing. Um, so, right, because like there was like this fun era before the pandemic when you could only ever get part-time jobs. I don't know if any college educated people remember that where you're like part-time at the mall and then part-time at the restaurant and then like part-time at the liquor store and then like somehow you cobble together a, li a living. That's like basically what I was doing. So when I tossed Mary Kay on top, I didn't have a lot of time, but I like sold a thousand dollars. A lot of it was because I had inventory on my shelf. It was summertime. I have a really nice backyard. I had friends coming over like every single day to just like drink coffee and hang out. And I'd sell like $20, $40 each. You know what I mean? I think I sold like probably $300 just incidentally to friends coming through. So, and that's what I was, I was told that that's what would happen, right? Like the incidental sales, your sales are three times more if it's on your shelf. People don't want to wait, but if it's there, they'll take it home with them. Like that all like came, that was so bang on. It's exactly what happened. I ordered the inventory. I had it on hand. I sold a lot at parties because it was there for them to try and take home with them. People are always so impressed that you have it. So it makes you feel like a real business owner and you feel so great. You know what I mean? It's like all the things that they're telling you just kind of get confirmed. And so you're like, yeah, I should definitely do that. I should just definitely keep investing in inventory. So yeah, I sold a thousand in my first week. Uh, and that was like a sales target for me because there was this training thing coming up that I had to qualify for. And you had to qualify by either having a team of three being that red jacket that I was talking about, either having a team of three or a thousand dollar week. I was like brand, brand new in the business, not interested in recruiting. I went for the sales goal. I hit the sales goal. I went to the training. That was like the first kind of training thing that I was ever at. So that was when like the toxic positivity started, excuse me. Uh, and it was kind of like, that, that was like it. I was really focused on sales for a few months. I kept investing in inventory. I was, I honestly, I sold product pretty well. Like when I just focused on sales for those first three months before I started team building, like I did well, I think my first month I like profited $800, not, not profited on top of like my $3,000, but like, you know, if I make a 50% profit, I think I sold like $1,600 in my first month or something like that. Like mm. after the thousand dollar, you know what I mean? Like yeah. The numbers were good. Like my numbers were really good in my first few weeks to months. They were great. I was focused on sales. I, um, I am probably a person who would do really well in an MLM. Like if I could have just like brought myself to keep doing it, like just to, if I could have just forced myself to keep bringing people in at 10 to 20 a month, which is what you need to do just to like maintain. If I could have like, uh, yeah, got myself to do that because I didn't find the sales component hard. I didn't find getting customers hard. What I found hard was once I started recruiting and realizing that like nobody else was having the experience I was having, you know, and I bet you, you probably were a little bit the same because you were also in the top 1%. So you're like, oh, this business works when you work. Oh, she just needs to call more people. Like you're, you know what I mean? And eventually and then, it feels like you're recruiting to fail. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's so heartbreaking to watch your recruits lose their confidence. And it's just like, it was, I just found recruiting so hard, like just awful you know, and now I know why, because I was, I was like literally recruiting people into a pyramid scheme for them to like lose their confidence and their money and their self-esteem and all their hope for their future. Like that's and basically, you're not, you know, you're not supposed to feel sorry for them though. Like no, if you bring no. them up to your upline, like I'm worried about my girls, they're not doing well. How can I help them? You they're are adults. instantly like, well, they need to work harder. You yeah. did it so they can yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah. Would you, would you claim, would you claim, uh, the credit for their successes? No. Well then why are you claiming the credit for their failures? Yeah. Yeah. Ex yeah. All of it. And, and the, you know, well, how many, how many, how many phone calls did she make? Well, I don't know. Well, find out well, how many, you know, how many classes, like it, you'll always find a number that they didn't do enough of, right? Like how many phone calls did they make? Well, how many new business, like how many new contacts did they get? How many trade shows do they have on their books? How many facial boxes do they have out? How many classes are they holding in a week? How, you know what I mean? Like you, you can, you'll, you'll come up with a number where they're not doing enough. You absolutely will. And then you'll be justified that like, oh yeah, they're not failing because the business sucks. They're failing because they're choosing to fail, apparently, right? Like, yeah. because they have a fear of success, perhaps, you know? It's so bad. It's so bad. So, yeah. Yeah, it's so bad. So, yeah, like, I, I started with about 3000 I sold 1000 right away. I invested in another 3000 I had, like, a party where people wanted to sample lipstick, so I, like, ordered every single flip and lipstick. Like, what? I don't know. I just, like, was really in it for the long haul. Like, I really right. thought I was going to be the next shopper's drug mart. Like, and so how did you that, yeah. go from... 
like when you first went to that first conference and you said you, that that's when the toxic positivity started, did you have any red flags go up or not really? No, okay. no. Um, I'm trying to think of like why. Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't have any red flags go up really. <sighs> I didn't have any red flags go up because I was raised in a very similar environment in the church where yeah. you just put everything on faith and you don't question. Yeah, that's, I was kind of going to say that. I was like, how do I put this? Because see, I didn't grow up in a religious family, but I was a re very religious child. Like I just, I, I <laughs> just took it upon myself to be highly religious. I really did. Um, I mean, no, there's a reason to it. I, like I was, uh, honestly, I was like really, really bullied when I was young. And as a young teenager, uh, you know, I'd heard the message that Jesus loves me, but like 13 year old me really needed to know that Jesus loved me. And I just took that real seriously. <laughs> um, so I was like a, like an evangelical Christian, like a real born again, like purity culture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like all the whole, yeah, I went to Bible college for two years, you know, just like literally invested $20,000 just to read the freaking Bible. Like what? Um, <laughs> they think about how, like, I could have backpacked across Europe with that money. Are you kidding me? I spent two years like in some dumpy little town where nobody liked me learning about the Bible. Like, freaking why? Uh, and that was the beginning of me being like, maybe this faith thing isn't for me because I don't seem to like any of the other people who believe in this stuff. <laughs> um, and I was pretty much ready to walk completely away from my faith. Like, I was a very devout Christian for 10 years, uh, at least, and maybe 15. I was very, very devout, very religious. And then I just started, you know, I left my hometown, met all these Christians, realized I didn't really like any of them, and was like, maybe this isn't for me. And then... I fell into Mary Kay where I met all these, like, it was like a different type of Christian. And it like kind of reeled me back into the faith because, which I'm like, not like they both ended at the same time now. Like I left Mary Kay and I was like, this Christian thing is not for me. <laughs> It was an MLM Christian. <laughs> it was like, I was like a real MLM Christian. Well, cause once I was like, I already was like kind of like a wavering Christian. And then I got signed up with Mary Kay. And so I was like surrounded by all these Christian women. So then I started referring to myself as being culturally Christian. Cause I was like, well, I'm in a Christian like mixing pot whatever you know I know the I know the bible and the words and the psalms and all the things that you're gonna say to me so I can definitely pass myself off as a Christian right I'm happily an ex-Christian now but I've heard and I wanted to ask you this is okay. Christianity really pushed in Mary Kay God first family second career third though that those are the three those are the three pillars of the of, yeah that was like Mary Kay's whole goal was to create a company where women could live out their priorities in that order. Yeah. So I'm assuming, and you'll, you'll be able to tell me this because you were in it, but I'm the, the MLMs that do that, that push their religion in it, to me, they use spiritual abuse to keep people in longer. Well, this is what God's plan is for you. Yeah. Or I use this say, business as your witness. I've heard that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And that for like, especially if you were a really devout Christian and you got recruited into Mary Kay, I could see how it could be so abusive because people really do, you know, believe that this is like their missionary field, you know, and it's a lot easier to witness to people when you're selling them lipstick than it is knocking on the door with a Bible, which I mean, you know, like all the rest of it. And so for me, like when I was a devout Christian, I never liked rules. So I wasn't like, I say I was religious, but it really was like a very like, uh, sincere, like personal faith for me. Uh, I like, I followed all the rules, but it wasn't about that for me. It was about like this sincere faith I had. Um, so like, I've always been like, I guess a very sincerely faithful person. And so I can really see where just like my tendency to be that way, my tendency to have hope and to believe and to, um, think that I, I want to want to use what I'm doing as like a way to shed light and positivity to people and to brighten their day, you know, like to even like, I would never, um, be the type of person to like witness to someone or like be like, yes, let me tell you about my Lord and savior. Like I was never like that kind of a pushy Christian, but I really like one of my favorite quotes was St. Francis of Assisi preach to everyone you meet. And if you absolutely have to use words, I just like loved the idea of just like living a life of faith of just like being a genuinely good person and people just knowing that by how you live without ever mentioning Jesus or God or your religion and just them knowing you're a person of faith just by how you are. So for me, using like Mary Kay as a mission field, like that was a little bit appealing to me because you're not just banging on people's doors, like waving pamphlets in their face, uh, which I saw enough of in university from like the campus Christian groups for me to be like, Ugh, I don't, I'm not, I do not want any part of that. 
So I liked the idea that you're offering people something that's like a genuine service to them that they genuinely want, you know, this product that they like, this relationship that's help helpful for them, you know, um, you know, the person who's going to help them have the right shade of foundation and recommend a good moisturizer for them, who's going to take their, you know, we had a really good return policy. So I always loved, like, I loved the customer service aspect of, you know, helping people find a product that they loved that was going to work for them. And then if they didn't like it, the fact that we, I could exchange it with the company gave me a lot of freedom to like, let people try things. You know, I really like enjoyed that. And I really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, like that idea of just using genuine human relationships to have that be maybe an expression of faith, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I can really see where if you're someone who is maybe like you wanted to be a missionary, like I could see where you'd be like, well, this is my mission field. Like I, and, and like to wrap up all this faith and everything else in it. Like I was a bit of a wavering Christian when I first entered Mary Kay. So it was like, you know, kind of like an uneasy relationship between the two, I think. But I think that if you were like a person of like genuine conviction, I think that you could be so spiritually abused in that like in that setting it just depends on who your leader is too right like who the like my national would even say things she would also if you if you repeat this i'll deny it so she'll deny it but uh you know she would say things like christian women were like the hardest to work with because they were like so like wanting to please their husbands and like i know women who were in cadillacs who quit because they were told that it was like not godly that they were making so much money or that they were Maybe earning more, more than, than their, their, their husbands, husbands. Yeah, like absolutely. Like, Whoa. so I mean, I saw the spiritual abuse wall, like literally pushing women out of Mary Kay because wow. they were like so conservatively Christian that they weren't allowed to make money. Did you Mary know, Kay corporate push? No, no. At all? Uh, sort of. It's definitely, it's like, it's in the literature. Like I, I definitely saw like the words, God first, family second, career third. Like I saw that printed places. Uh, it was discussions that we had with corporate because the company at a time started to pivot into this faith first, family second, career third. And so then there was like, you know, the older school Mary Kay people who didn't like that. So there was always like, just, you know, talks about like, we're, we don't want to get rid of the God. It's not enough to have faith, has to be God, because that's what Mary Kay wanted. So they were so, trying to be more modern. Yeah, I think that the company is probably in the same awkward position that like the general church is in, which is like you're trying to modernize. I mean, like the church is trying not to die. Mary Kay's trying to have a customer base. You know, there's a lot of like faith based, uh, like so or like there's a lot of social issues that people of faith will have very polarizing opinions on. Um, I think that for me, that was probably something that, again, like seeing christians who weren't discriminating against people for being gay like i loved that i mean obviously they weren't discriminating because like everybody like if you've got a paycheck you know if you've got a face like it's you know what i mean like and i think that maybe that can show you how it's not a church like i mean as much as that's like a great thing that they're not discriminating against you know people who like look or live a certain way but uh still it, it's Are they inclusive with their shade ranges very yeah, I just watched the first part of your Pure Romance uh, interview that just came out. Uh, and so I, I listened in on that like little discussion of the foundation shades. Yeah, Mary Kay's shade range is very inclusive. There's uh, seven shades of ivory, eight shades of beige, eight shades of bronze in like the widest range. And then there's like, you know, like five or six different foundations that have five or six different types of shade ranges. And I'm not saying this because I'm trying to like spin a big positive uh, message about Mary Kay, like, oh, like, they're so great and inclusive, and, like, the products are awesome, even though I do personally, like, everything I'm wearing on my face is Mary Kay, obviously, like, I'm gonna use it. Right. Um, I liked the product. I, I also thought that the price point was fine. Like, that's another thing that I hear people say in the anti-MLM community that, like, you know, MLM products always suck, and that the price is, it's not about the product, so the products always suck, and you could always get a better product for cheaper somewhere else, and the reason that I'm mentioning this is because I had a conversation with someone who I met through Facebook marketplace when I started breaking the rules and selling product that way. And so I got a lot of free therapy from people throughout my city who have been burned by Mary Kay and, you know, coming by and being like, how's it going selling product against the rules on marketplace. And I met this one woman and I, I was talking to her about my experience and she said, but you shouldn't be so hard on yourself because you thought the product was the business. And I realized that's so true. Of course I did. Like I always liked the product. I, like I said, always had a good experience with selling the product that was never like a problem for me. But that doesn't mean that the business is just great and you should like recruit everyone into it. 
you know, like there's still like, there can, like, it can be a good product and there's still be like millions of like abuses and predatory behavior and like questionable things going on. Right. You and know? I, think it's, like, I think it's important to recognize that not everything about somebody's experience in an MLM was yes. bad. Yeah. And because that isn't just to say like, oh, it's all around. Every little thing was bad. That's not realistic because if it was, it wouldn't be hard for people to walk away. Right. And, you know, as somebody who's like been in an abusive relationship before in my first marriage, it's hard to leave those types of relationships because they're not all bad. And so yeah, of course. good days, you're like, oh, well, maybe this is working. Maybe this is how they say it will be. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I totally agree with you there. And I think what she said about oh you you thought the product was the business is very uh i haven't heard that before but that's true like we, people yeah. join thinking like this product is amazing and i'm i'm having good and i like it so why wouldn't i sell it yeah I, I would recommend a movie i like to my friend so why wouldn't i recognize a moisturizer i like to my friend it's how so many times have so you had a lip gloss and then your friend goes out and buys the same lip gloss right and you know? how so you had been in and you were selling well and then you started recruiting how long did it take for you to get the car and what was it like building up to that so i signed in april i went to seminar in the end of july very beginning of august it's august long so first weekend of august so seminar is like the big like annual all the consultants go well not obviously they don't actually but like all the consultants can go it's uh, you know uh like an nsync concert on steroids um <laughs> without so, nsync <laughs> without nsync being there it's just women in dresses telling you that you can do it <laughs> so uh, we don't know what you can do but you can do it um seminar was a lot so much i uh i <sighs> I started crying like the begin like, from the beginning and I don't think I stopped. Like I just cried and cried and cried and cried. And I don't know why. Like it, at this now I think that it was my soul literally screaming, but <laughs> at the time um I didn't understand it. Like it was so I I think part of it I think I'm just a very emotional person and I'm quite sensitive and I think that when you get like it's like an estrogen fueled like thunder to thunderdome of like toxic positivity and like, like the lights and like the music i'm an extrovert i love stimulation i'm not like saying i'm not like oh i had like a panic attack because there was too many people it wasn't that it was like i had like an emotional overwhelm meltdown because there were too many feelings like it was so I, I don't know like i can't explain the experience other than that it was overwhelming i cried for four days straight i barely slept i could hardly eat like it was so weird um and they at the time weird. and like at one time my director was like are you okay yeah she like pretty much ignored me the whole time which was really rough because i like thought i was gonna spend some quality time with her and then i barely you know uh i was like very low-key obsessed with my director at the beginning i thought she was like the coolest smartest hottest best most successful person i'd ever met and i wanted to be exactly like her when i grew up even though we were the same age uh <laughs> yeah like real interesting power dynamic um that there is <laughs> that's how it is when you sign up with an upline there it's a very yeah. interesting power dynamic so yeah i was like definitely i just she's a very good love bomber um and i just thought that i was like the most important like person in the world and that i was going to be so successful and um I, yeah i was and so that was part of the decision for me to go to seminar because we have in canada we just have one seminar like for the entire country so like the, the weekend itself costs like three thousand dollars like you have to fly there you got hotels yeah like it's like a big expense Wait, was it, but it was in Canada? Yeah. And it was three grand? Well, I mean, by the time you book your flights and everything, yeah. Like the actual, the actual conference, you pay like, I think $250 or something like that. For, for the it. ticket, like the but you mean all together. Very, yeah, but yeah. like the personal expense is, you know, you have, and of course, like you stay in the, so the seminar of my first year was in Montreal. So we were in downtown Montreal, um, staying at like, the freaking Sheraton or something, you know, like a really, like some real $400 a night type hotels that we stay in. Of course, there's, excuse me, there's like four of us to a room, you know, the whole drill, the, the whole, the whole four to a room thing. So, I mean, I guess the seminar is probably closer to like maybe 2000 for most people. It's probably not 3000. That's an exaggeration, but. But so yeah. And then yeah. you buy merch while you're there. Yeah. Well, like I didn't, I like my first seminar, I was so broke. I went to the grocery store and I bought like some croissants and like a wheel of cheese and a bag of apples and I ate that three meals a day like that is what I ate. <laughs> um I, but 
I mean, I was happy to be in Montreal. I love to travel. So I, I loved that I got to go to Montreal. Um, I at first wasn't planning to go to seminar. Like I'd only been in the business for three months. And then I was like, yes, let me like go and spend as much as I've spent on inventory. Let me go and do that again on seminar. Uh, no, I didn't spend that much. I didn't spend like 3000. It was like around a couple grand. Um, still that's a lot of money. Well, yeah, especially for just in retrospect, basically nothing, right. <laughs> just to go and like do nothing. And, uh, yeah, I just, you know, for me, I would say that that was like the real toxic positivity, like brainwash beginning, uh, you know, because I just learned that if it's to be, it's up to me. And if I believe it, I can achieve it. And, um, I just like, I think that the reason it was such an emotional week for me, a weekend for me was because it was just like hearing all these messages of like, I can do it. I can do anything I want. I can like, you know, why not me? And I just left seminar like, so just like with such a clear vision in my mind of like, I was going to be a director. I was going to, you know, earn a trip. I was going to like take it to the top. I, you know, and I just believed that I could have it all. Um, and I wanted it all and I was willing to do what it took. And I was like in it like seminar. I was, I was sold. I was 100% sold after seminar. Um, so I came home and I started, I saw like, I think I did like 46 facials. Like I saw 46 people in like my first month back. Yeah. Like I was going to be a director. I was doing it. Um, so I, yeah, I saw the people and I think I added like five people to my team in my first month, something like that. I had a couple that my director had added like around, but I wasn't really paying attention. You know what I mean? You give her your contacts. She would like set it up. I think she recruited a couple people. Um, by the, within two months of coming back from seminar, I had my 10 people assembled so that I could so go into on. qualifications. For hold on, let me back up. Yeah. You give her your contacts and she sets it up. How does that work? Well, when you have someone who's selling lots of product, but they're not really recruiting, <laughs> what directors will sometimes do is say, well, do you just want to give me like the names of everybody that you facialed and I'll invite them for career coffees. So that, so she offered to do, to do some of that for me. To, okay. To help to, to get them to sign up under you. Oh yeah. Okay. So in Mary Kay, the way that it works is you, or the way it was worked like with me anyway, you don't do your own career coffees or like business info chats or whatever you want to call them. You don't do your own career coffees until you're a director. It depends on who your director is. Like okay. some directors are just like, good luck kid, but you're supposed to do all the career coffees for everybody in your unit. And then they watch you and they learn. And then by the time they're directors, they have you memorized and they can do the same. Oh my God. People who are in your unit forever and ever will probably just get the scripting down and they'll start doing it their own, like before they become directors or people who are never going to be directors. I mean, some people are in the business for 20 years. I'm sure they're doing their own career coffees now. Um, but no directors do all they try. Because directors are so much better at it, right? They're just going to like sit there and make you feel uncomfortable till you sign. But like your friend is going to be like, oh, thanks for listening. Let's go have coffee, right? Like if you're like consultants aren't going to um, sacrifice their personal relationships and make their friends uncomfortable to like force them to make a decision on the spot. But like a director would, right? Interesting. So that would explain why that woman who kept calling me like would not take no for an answer because she was my friend's upline. Oh yeah, and probably. Yeah. She just would. And I just remember my friend being like, will oh. you talk with her? Will you talk well, with her? And I was, I was like, yeah, sure. And of course in the MLM mm -hmm. stuff, like we would, when in the companies I was in, we would do that for other people if they asked yeah. us, but it wasn't like that. Like, so construct, uh, just set up like that. It was just like, oh, on a whim, like if they want you to help them recruit somebody, sure. I'll talk to them. But I just remember like, I didn't even know this lady and she was just oh, like, yeah. dreams. What are your goals? I mean, as a director, you will just do anything, right? Like, <laughs> that's what I would say. I mean, I, I, I think that what's, what I would imagine probably happened with your friend is your friend wanted to move into DIQ. She was like scared and didn't know how to move forward. And so her director was like, well, why don't you write down a list of like the 10 sharpest women you know? And I'll call them and I'll make them feel special and I'll book them for the interview and I'll, sh you know, give them what they, what I, you know, offer them a free lipstick or a $10 gift card or whatever, you know, and, and some and directors, like I would often do that, offer product off my own. I mean, I had so freaking much of it. Um, I would offer product off my own shelf to get people to listen for my unit members, like all the time. Wow. You just give away free product that you purchased. Yeah. And I think that that's like something that's important to mention too, because I mean, how much of the product that I like thought I was selling, was I actually selling? Or was I just like giving it away in like desperate attempts to get people to join my team? Wow. So, and that's, a, that's so costly. <laughs> that's yeah, so yeah. costly. I'm, yeah. When I looked at my finances, I realized it was. <laughs> so you 
so she recruits some people under you and you start moving up and then when did it get to like you're like oh the car like everything's amazing yeah so after seminar things moved pretty quickly within two months i was in director qualifications three months after that i was done so i was a new director january 1 2016 so eight months after signing it was like boom inventory Whoa. into diq out of diq and actually when i finished my directorship i actually qualified for my first car at the same time so that was my first car uh within all of that within eight months um the first car was just like a cash compensation so i was just getting 500 dollars a month deposited into my bank account if i qualified for it which i sometimes did <laughs> that's that's like the catch right is like you qualify to potentially keep getting it if you keep qualifying uh so i qualified for my car which was just a 500 dollars a month cash compensation in january and then three weeks into january i went to leadership which was in the united states that's north america wide it's all the direction it's all the directors in north america uh sometimes i do like several of them but this one was like a big one in la everybody was coming and so it was so important for me to finish directorship by january 1st so that i could go to leadership because i wanted to go to leadership so bad uh, and so I did finish directorship and I did go to leadership. Um, and then when I got back, there was somebody in my unit who wanted to move up into directorship. She had just started in like December. She decided she wanted to move up in February. Uh, she recruited 10 in the month of February. I got her, we got him active. We got her into DIQ for March 1st. She finished her directorship at the end of April. She finished her qualifications for the end of April. So she was a new director at the end of April. And then the production generated from her DIQ is what pushed me into my second car. And that is no pun intended when the wheel started to fall off. <laughs> Not the car, but my whole life. <laughs> so what's a second car? Because I'm sure oh. you don't have two cars sitting on the driveway. I, I mean, you earned like a better car. Than yeah, I earned a better car. So then I, I, so the first car that you can earn is it's the consultant car. So you can actually earn a car in Meadow Lake just or Meadow Lake in Mary Kay just as a consultant. Okay. Yeah, for there's like sales. so many levels of cars. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, there's like five levels of cars. So there's like the career car, which is what I earned, or the, sorry, the consultant car, which is what I earned when I like, I earned it as a consultant while becoming a director. Do you know what I mean? Okay. So I basically like had the car and the directorship in the same day. Because What did you have to do to earn that car? The car was, uh, you have four months to earn it. Over the course of four months, you need to do 22,000 wholesale production. Uh, you can't fall below 5,000 any one of those months. Um, but obviously you have to do more than five, but like it can't, it has to be at least 5,000 for all four of those months, totaling up to 22,000. And over the course of those four months, you build your team from 10 to 14 people. I think it's like 14 people. Yeah. A team of 14. Wow. Now those numbers aren't real life because what group of 15 people is going to generate $22,000 in wholesale production. So that should be 44,000 in retail. Like if we were selling it, the retail is like what we would sell it for, right? The wholesale is just what we're paying. So like what team of 15 people is going to sell $44,000 worth of skin? Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's not like, that's not how the numbers work, but it looks good on paper for people who don't know any better. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, how does it work? You sign 14 other people up who all start with inventory. And if everyone, like if 14 people all start with like $3,000 worth of inventory wholesale, then yeah, you'll have your car like licked no problem. Will any of them ever sell it? Who can say, but you'll have your car. Right. Okay. So that's what one car. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like the, the so the, the car that you earn as a consultant is just a cash compensation, but they call it a car because it used to be that you could have a car or the cash. What they were finding was that in Canada, like in the United States, the, the consultants still do get a physical car if they want. But what they were finding in Canada was that nobody was taking the physical car because what consultant is going to be able to maintain car production with a team <laughs> of 14 people, right? Like, so this rumor was going around in Canada that it doesn't make, it doesn't work to get the car and you just lose money. So then every, there was like something like 10 Mary Kay cars for consultants in the road in all of Canada. And everyone else was just taking the cash call, <laughs> right? Because if you qualify for the cash, yay, $500. If you don't qualify for the cash, oh, well, but once you have the car in your driveway, if you don't qualify at the end of the month, you have to pay $500 for the lease of the car you're driving. So if you're just like a consultant, like this isn't your, you're not a director, you're not full time. Like, why would you sign yourself up for this like commitment to like continue 
this production requirement for the next two years. Like it, right. it, it's such a dumb thing to do as a consultant. I mean, I didn't think so at the time. I was like, oh, turning off that, passing off that free advertising and all this lack mentality and don't you want to grow? Why would you think of having less when you could think of having more? Like, I just thought it was the dumbest thing ever to take the cash. But uh, in Canada, the cash was the only thing available. So uh, at the end of December, 2015, when I became a director, I also earned that consultant cash compensation, uh, which was the $500 a month, just direct deposited into my account with my commission checks, if I had any. Uh, and then at the end of April, I moved into the physical, uh, actual car that I actually like picked up and drove around. That was a Ford Focus. So that's the grand achiever level. Is uh, that pink? It is not pink. It is oh. black. You, it doesn't, it's not pink until you're in the Cadillac. Oh, so there's okay. the consultant car. There's the grand achiever car for directors. There's the like mid-level car for directors. And then there's the pink Cadillac. So there's like four car levels in Mary Kay. And sometimes five. They'll sometimes throw in a bonus one for a promotion. So, wow. and when it, you got that car, did you feel like I've made it like, this is incredible or were you yeah. still struggling or what was going on? Well, it was so good to, it felt so good to have that like external sign of success that like everybody could see. And I did enjoy like the advertising component. I did have people like, you know, approach me from time. I think it happened like twice in like five years, but still, um, I, like I, I was, I felt like I really had like that external symbol of success, I guess. Um, like I felt good picking it up, you know, it was, uh, well, actually, you know what? Now I'm like thinking back. It's interesting that you say that because the company actually had to like harass me to send my paperwork and so that they could send me the car. And I didn't even get the car as soon as I could have. It was on like the next car shipment because I was like, they send them out like every few months. Uh, and I was, I didn't even get it as soon as I possibly could because I was like so tardy with sending in my papers. Why? I don't know. I, there, there was, a, I didn't, I wasn't excited to pick up that car. I mean, I told myself I was, and I acted like I was, but like, I actually, so I got the car, like I, I earned the car in April, 2016. So a year after I started, I was in a car. Seminar, like I said, is in July. So like Mar April, May, June, July. So three months passed. I was literally at seminar, like in Toronto when head office called me and they were like, we need your paperwork like today or you're not getting your car before Christmas. And so I was like in Toronto, like calling my insurance and everything, getting my papers. Like that's how long I waited. Like I earned the car and I took over three months to send my paperwork in so that they could like begin the ordering process for my car. Um, wow. Yeah. Wow. I remember when I earned the car in my, my last company, my first company didn't offer it. Okay. Um, my last company, I, w I got the car. And I remember like when I first joined, I was like so excited to, to shoot for that goal. And then as time went on and I realized what all goes into the car and what you do, have to do to maintain it and that they wouldn't give me $500 cash. I had to just do the, do the car. Yeah. Um, I just started feeling apprehensive about it. And yeah. I remember they would shoot me those emails like, Hey, you've earned the car. We need to like yeah. move towards the paperwork, yada, yada. And I ended up just turning it down because I was starting to become disillusioned with the industry anyway. But it sounds like you were in a different spot because you were still early on in it and still moving well, up. I think that's like kind of like how they get you because like for you to earn the car in your business, like I would imagine that your qualifications were probably similar to like what the Cadillac qualifications are, you know, but the fact that like Mary Kay has been, and like they used to only offer the Cadillac too, but because it, they've been around since like 1963, like they just have the brand power and the capital. I don't know what they got. They have the ability to offer, you know, so like, I mean, you know, like my car qualifications were like a fraction probably of what yours were. Um, and I think that's kind of, but once you're in the car, you're like locked in, like you have to, you either pay for it or you qualify for it every quarter. So yeah, yeah looking back, you know, there's a lot of, like, I didn't ask questions. Like when I, like I became a director without realizing that there was a there was a production quota for directors. Like I didn't know. I like literally didn't like that. And that's like my own too bad. Like I'm sure like that information was out there for me, but yeah, I was but probably very, not preaching it from the rooftops. <laughs> no. And I was very actively avoiding any kind of information that could mess with my head. Right. So I, I was like, you know, like very intentionally withholding information from myself. Like the, the self brainwashing for me is so much was so much more than probably anything else because I was, you know, convinced early on. Well, you know, you, I was living in my vision and I, I learned very early that 
uh, your brain can't tell the difference between like reality, which like this is kind of true. Like your brain can differentiate between like real life and not real life. That's why you get really invested in movies. Like you really literally believe these people died. That's why you're crying at like a fictional character, right? And so I was like, you know, same thing with real life. So let me just like spin myself up this movie where like I only, the only with the positivity, only with the best case scenario and like don't even ask a question that could possibly yield an answer that would mess with my head and you and know that's so. a lot of the law of attraction bs and yes, i remember yes, yes. jack canfield saying in his book the success principles which i recommended to everyone who joined my team oh yes yes he would talk about that about the part of the brain that it can't mm-hmm. tell the difference between real what's real mm-hmm. and what's not and so if you constantly tell yourself that this is going to happen this way your yes. brain can't differentiate and it'll start doing those actions it, to make yeah it happen. You'll, you'll just become it yeah. it's complete bs um it's so manipulating too so and it's fine to tell people that if you're not telling them that so that they continue to invest their money believing that something's gonna happen you know right yeah it's so emotionally manipulating so you are in this car and it's i mean from the outside and it probably looks like you were doing incredible when did it all start to go downhill for you right then right then and there yeah, really? like as soon as I offspring my, as soon as I had my offspring sales director. So, okay, so I didn't like, quite fully explain that. So like if someone in your unit decides to become a director, then they go into DIQ, director qualifications, uh, director in qualification is what that stands for. So they go into DIQ and they have up to three or four months to finish it. And then they're directors. And when they become directors, they take themselves and their entire team. And they're now part of your downline, I guess. They'd be like an offspring. And that would make me now a senior sales director. So that was like the highest I ever went was senior sales director with one offspring unit um, in like the grand achiever car. That was where I, uh, I, you know, the girl who I offspring who became a director, I, she wasn't, I didn't feel like she was like equipped for success and I didn't feel like I could equip her for it. And uh, what's that mean to offspring somebody? Oh, that's when, when someone in your unit becomes a director themselves. Okay. Yeah, so I offsprang her. So there so when I was becoming a director myself, I recruited this girl and then I became a director. And so she was part of my unit. And then after I became a director, she also wanted to become a director. So when I helped her become a director, she took her team and like it left my unit. That's what happens in Mary Kay. When you have an Oh, offspring- that's called breakaway. Oh, okay. Yeah, we call it offspring. Yeah. Okay. So I had the woman. Okay, sorry to interrupt, but the yeah, I fine, joined the skincare and cosmetics company. I joined. That was my last company that I earned the car in. The founder of that company had been super successful in Mary Kay and mm-hmm. for oh. a long time. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And then she I started her company. own company, and she would always preach how we don't have breakaway here. And I was like, "What the hell is breakaway?" But now it's <laughs> that's what she's talking about. Oh, see, and we told we, we were told like I know that woman, and she co-founded the company with Mary Kay, and then she had all these terrible bad ideas, and she took all the skincare formulas, and she left and started her own company, and tries to copy us, but they didn't. The new company didn't have the the capital, and so they can't afford the research. So they're just selling old Mary Kay product from the '60s, while Mary Kay <laughs> continues to uh, be cutting edge and the best. That was what I—that's how I heard. Is that the story that you heard? That's what they told me. The I know. Drama, it's a, I cannot. <laughs> girl drama. It's so stupid. Like high school all over again. Yeah. And like this is what they say about companies. Can you imagine what they say about the, the people who leave? Like, yeah. You know, you know what they say. Uh, yeah. So it's called offspringing. So, um, yeah, like. It's so hard for me to talk about these sorts of things because like, do I want to tell you what I really think and like risk looking like I'm being a victim and I'm not taking, you know what I mean? Or like, do you want to see me take responsibility? Cause like I can take responsibility if you want. Here's the thing. Uh, We're people (laughs) in MLMs and a lot of the times the reason they don't speak out is because of the shame from not only being a victim, but also a perpetrator. Yeah. So we all know you recruited people. We all know that you knew like they weren't doing very well, but you kept telling yourself they just need to work harder. I did the same thing. So yes, you can take responsibility for it, but still share how you were a victim. Absolutely. I allow that on my channel. Absolutely. Because it, it needs to be talked about. Yeah, well, especially when you are someone who's, you know, shown the out, and it's also just important for people to know that I showed all the outward trappings of success and was not really ever that successful, in all honesty. Um, There's always like that, you know, but like, could I have been like, maybe, does it matter? Not at all. Like, it doesn't matter at all if I could have tried harder and done better, because I, it's not a place where I want to try hard and do well. (laughs) So, 
uh, I'm fine with that now. But so like the whole car system is really, the word I want to say is insidious, but that's like kind of dramatic. I mean, what my national would say is what job would you ever have where they would give you a car and then you quit working and they let you keep the car, right? Like that's, that's like what, what, what we were told. So when you earn the car, now there's a production quota. And if you don't make that quota every quarter, then whatever your deficit is comes out of your commission checks. I was also having quite a few people returning inventory because like you said, they do have a 90% buyback. I was really great at getting people to come in with inventories at first. Like when I first, first started, my inventory numbers were insane. I hadn't, I didn't understand why people were starting with inventory. I didn't like, I was just doing, I was just saying the words I was told to say. And like my results were like outrageous. That's why I offspring someone immediately, like three months after becoming a director, I was able to like pull up enough production and people to do it all again. Yeah. Um, but when I pulled up all the production and people and did it all again, and then started looking at how like none of these people who started with inventory were doing as well as I was doing. And I didn't know what to tell them. I, as a new director, I just had this feeling of like, I didn't realize it was going to be this hard to find another me. Like I was just like, I just need, if I could just find an exact replica of myself, I could help that person. I could help her. And I think that's, that's like the problem. I was in the company for eight months and then I was a director myself because it was, you know, faster is best, faster is easier. Slow is hard, fast is easy. You and I both know why slow is hard because the longer you leave people in the company, the more likely they are to get disillusioned and leave. And then you got to start building your team all over again. But if you build it really fast while everyone's all excited and competitive and everyone thinks they're selling product and everyone thinks they're making money and everyone's talking about how exciting it is and talking about, uh, you know how much money they're making and you really everyone's talking about it so it must be true and so there's all this excitement and everyone's coming in with inventory and so the next person's gonna have inventory because the first person does and you know you just create this like everyone comes in and ev everyone joins when they learn about Mary Kay and everybody has great classes and everybody has inventory and you just like create this like frenzy really like this frenzy of not wanting to be left behind and not wanting to be the only one who's not doing well um and then like now I realize nobody's doing well but that's why they like to get you to do faster is best. And so I became a director eight months in. My director told me, you know, don't worry about once you become a director, you'll figure it out when you go. Like, don't basically, like she basically told me, don't think about the position until you're there. Don't even think about it. Just do the requirements. And then when you get there, you'll grow into the position once you're there. So like, I didn't know, I didn't like, I mean, I could have read up on it, but like, I wasn't aware that there was like a production requirement every month as a director. But like, I, it wouldn't have made a difference. I was like so determined that I like, cause I wasn't gonna be the loser who was struggling for production every month. I was gonna be like the awesome winner in a pink car. So like, I didn't like, you know, I wasn't even in the headspace where I was like, let me think about the consequences. Um, so as little like forethought as I had getting into directorship, like then I'm in this position where I have a girl who also wants to be a director and so I just ended up doing all the work of DIQ all over again. Like she didn't learn, you know what I mean? Like she, it was just, I was encouraged to move her up so quickly. Cause I was told, Oh, you got to move her up fast. Cause she's the type of person who will get bored if she's not winning. So you got to make sure she's like winning right from the get go. So because she wanted to go into directorship so quickly and I, we were all encouraging this like faster is better breaking records, all, you know, youngest, you know, the, who can become a director the soonest after they sign their agreement, who can like be the least qualified and prepared for their job. Like, it's just like a, a literal race to the bottom. And uh, like, I found myself as a director with like no idea how to really tell people how to sell product. Like I thought I did, cause I could sell product, you know, but what I like got told a lot by people was, you know, well, you can sell product. Like you're really like bubbly or you're really extroverted. And I didn't, at the time I hated that. So I was like, no, like anybody can do it. Like, don't tell me it's because of me and my personality that I'm great at this. Like, tell me that I need to believe that every single person can be great at this. And it doesn't matter if she's like socially awkward or hates people or is a single mom with like absolutely no income or like access to a babysitter. Like I need to believe that everybody can be great at this. Like my whole worldview is my whole like life, my income, like everything about my life depends on me believing that everyone can do this and that there's no set person. And so I just, you know, recruited anyone who I could. I brought anyone in with inventory who was interested and then just like proceeded to observe nobody else earn cars or have thousand dollar weeks or, you know, and so like, what am I supposed to tell them? Like, I don't know. I've been, I've been doing this job for eight months. I don't know what I'm doing. And now I'm your leader and I've been told that I can do this and I'll figure it out. And everyone learns as they go. So I think in retrospect, 
I just didn't like being a director. I think I was having a great time when I was a consultant, when I was just selling product, working with customers. You know, I thought that that was fun. And then as soon as I had a, like a unit of people who were like looking at me to like teach them and lead them and train them, um, like, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to do that. Like, I, you know, how do you, how do you learn to be, how do you learn that job from the book, sell, book, recruit? Like, where's the, like, how do you, like, that's, you know, you're just told, you know, uh, put the product on, take the product off. How does it feel? Like, that's a skincare class. But like, what do you do when your recruit comes to me, comes to you and says like, I'm $20,000 in debt and I can't afford my credit card payments. And it's because of Mary Kay. Like, I don't know. Me too. Me too, girl. Like, I'm, what a great leader. You're following exactly in my footsteps. Like, and it'll you know, pay off. We just got to keep going. We just got to keep going. But you never know when you could recruit your next person who could turn it all around. Right. That, that They always, I would always hear, oh, you just need to recruit one person. Yeah. The, you just need successful. one person who will change your whole unit. Successful. And it'll change your entire business. One person who's as yeah. determined and it'll yeah. turn everything around, which is totally not a viable business <laughs> yeah. strategy. Just not at all. One person and then you'll make all this money. And, and, and what about like the other like 500 people you recruited finding them? Like to heck with those girls, I guess, because exactly. they're not the one person. Well, yeah. They didn't and try you're hard enough. Like. You're what? The beginning, like everyone can do this. Everyone can see success. And so you want to help these women succeed. And it's, it's painful when they don't. I truly think That's that a lot of the people so at the very, very top who stay in, um, and don't end up walking away. I just, I know that cognitive dissonance plays a role in it. I, I wonder if like, there are some like narcissists who just don't oh, yeah. don't feel empathy and I'm not diagnosing anybody. I'm not a psychologist, but I'm just like, how can like my first upline and I'm not calling her a nurse, but just how can she be in this now for like what almost 15 years? And like, I don't know how you can ignore the people below you failing for that long. Um, for you me, how did the dissonance only really work so long? Yeah. Yeah. You know, interesting about the narcissists. Um, I do believe all the CEOs are narcissists, 100%. Well, so statistically, there are more people, you know, with some form of psychopathy in like CEO positions, regardless of the industry, you know? So, I mean, the stats bear it out. I, I will say there were times when I, you know, Googled the traits of narcissists and, and like, and people with psychopathy or like sociopathy. And I, uh, saw familiar profiles that reminded me of people I knew. I'm all, you know, I have like exactly nine credits of psychology classes here, guys. Like I'm not an expert. I took three psych classes in university. Uh, so I just like know enough to know that I shouldn't diagnose anybody, but I. Right. When did it start like going down to where you were like becoming disillusioned with the industry or what happened there? I didn't become disillusioned with the industry until a year after I left. I always thought it was my fault. I always blamed my own lack of activity level for my lack of success. Uh, I invested a lot of money to maintain my directorship uh, status over quite a few years as a band-aid solution to my lack of willingness to recruit people. Uh, now looking back, I'm like so happy that I did that. Like at the time I felt like such a, ter like just such a fake loser and such a phony because I'm, like racking up my credit cards to, you know, continue to make production requirements so that I can continue to hold on to my unit and my directorship because, you know, I really genuinely like, and I, I, I held on to my unit for probably a good year or two years without any real, uh, business happening beyond like between me and my bank account. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, there was like, obviously some people like, you know, there was like the sputtering, gasping, dying corpse of a unit that was always kind of around. But I, after I off sprang, I never really replaced those people to any great degree. I never, I just like, uh, I couldn't make myself do it. Like, that's the honest answer. I couldn't, I just couldn't make myself do it, but I loved the uh, position of being a sales director. Mm -hmm. So you were talking about how, um, like, you, you know, people who are like higher up, like there's like some sort of like narcissism that goes on. And I think there probably is, but I think after having left the MLM, 
I think that like Mary Kay for sure operates honestly so much like Scientology that I like it reminds me so much of Scientology think of like Tom Cruise and how he's like everyone thinks that he's so weird for being in Scientology and he like it should have ruined his career but it just hasn't so good for him but you know everyone who's left Scientology says that he has so much power and like respect in that like in that organization that he'll never leave he's like godlike to them yeah and I think that that's how it is in Mary Kay too like literally when national sales directors are introduced everyone stands and applauds like it's the literal freaking queen um so there's like you know you you stand when a national sales director is being introduced you uh and when directors are being introduced too actually um and just like all the attention and the accolades and people telling me how great I was and all the prizes and um, you know, they can always find a way to like make it seem like you're doing, like you can always get a prize for something, even if you're not making money <laughs> to make right. it look like you're doing something. Yep. Um, but yeah, I would say that I, I stopped really working the business with any like fury pretty quickly after I offspring. I just like, I was noticing that nobody that I was bringing into the business was experiencing the level of success, excuse me, that I was. And I didn't know what to make of that. So I just bought inventory and gave it to people apparently and sold some of it and maintained my director status for years. Wow. And so yeah. you were able to maintain that director status without recruiting? I recruited like some, you know, like one or two a month or none between zero and three people a month I recruited. So there was always like a little, you know, like I was always like trying, I'd go to the director meeting at the beginning of the month and be like, yes, like I'm going to turn it all around. My past doesn't equal my future. This is, the month right and then four weeks later there's the like you know you're looking at the production that you have in you're looking at what your paycheck's going to be based on that and then you look at how much you have to invest and you look at how much your paycheck would be if you invested that and then you're like well like if i invest enough to make the first bonus then if i you know with the paycheck i'm gonna get i will really only be sinking like about a thousand dollars of my own personal money in the hole or it'll only be seven you know what i mean like you can but then i'll have all of this product right like i'm gonna i'm about to order like two thousand dollars worth of product so now i'll be able to like have like the, the best signing bonuses ever like my, my unit will be so huge now because i'm gonna have so much product that i can use for a signing bonus or use for a hostess gift or you know like hmm. I, I could always like I mean, looking back, obviously, it just, like, makes no sense. Like, at a certain point, you just have to do the actual thing or stop trying to pretend you're going to. But I just couldn't make myself do the thing, and I couldn't walk away. So I just stayed. And I I remember you saying, like, you, when you first left, you thought it was you who was the problem. Oh, yeah. And I, was, I felt a little bit like that, too. I yeah. felt like I had kind of given up, and people were looking at me like I was a loser, and it was hard. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was even having the success I did. And I still felt like that because you're indoctrinated to think that, that yes. anybody who walks away is a failure who didn't try yes. in their business. Exactly. Um, so Do people like running around in like literal $400 suits, driving like literal branded career cars, telling people they're doing so great. This is their, you know, they love their Mary Kay, all the re reasons that you should join your, their team. And that woman could like literally have four people in her unit. Well, not four, you'd lose. That woman could literally have like 20 people in her unit. So and it's just nothing. It's all smoke and mirrors. What suit? You have to buy a suit, like an actual clothing? Oh, yeah. From the company? Yeah. Well, we they partner with a clothing designer, but yeah, a clothing company. And they, they make you buy certain yeah. suits to... For yeah. Oh, I wish what? you knew this. I would give you a fashion show. I have $2,000 <laughs> worth of ugly suits in my closet I will never wear. <laughs> So what is, what are, what are the, how do they, how does that work out? Because if somebody was like, oh, you have to buy this outfit and this and this, I'd be like, kick rocks. But like, so how does that so come would about? Would you go if you were in it and, and you had just got to the big girls club and everyone Oh, totally. I would have bought it. Let's be honest. Like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no, I would love to wear that ugly suit. For sure I would. So do they have pantsuits or is it only dresses, like skirts? And skirt. Ugh, gross. Give me yeah, a yeah. break. Massage. have to wear the skirt gotta you gotta can't oh my god so yeah, it's so so you yeah. had to buy 400 one suit is 400 dollars. yeah yeah and you'd wear it for the year to all the events to everything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what this is like blowing my mind do yeah you, like, yeah you do yeah well so mary is very strict about their dress code right like consultants it's black skirt white shirt and then once you, yeah, and then once you have a nylons, 
and closed toe shoes. It's supposed to be closed toe. Like nobody enforces this obviously, but they'll have trainings where they're like, just so you know, open toe shoes aren't very professional. They should be closed. Um, so yeah, consultants, it's black skirt, white sh shirt, nylons, closed toe shoes. And then pantyhose. Yeah. Oh, pantyhose. Absolutely. Are you kidding me? 100% oh. you have to wear pot nylons. On You're expected to wear nylons on the plane to conference. <gasps> I did that a total of one time. I was like, nah, nah, guys, I'll wear a maxi dress so y'all can't see my legs, but these nylons, I'm-, I'm What not. in the 1950s housewife is happening? Oh my Can God. You imagine riding in a plane with like a pencil skirt and nylons? Like to heck with that. To heck with all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So then what? Okay. So then once you have your team of three, you become a red jacket and then you have the uh, privilege of ordering and paying for yourself a red blazer that will cost you between a hundred and $150, depending on the one that you pick. And it will feel like you're wearing a garbage bag. It's made out of like straight plastic. So polyester, just the worst thing you ever wore. <laughs> Freaking hated it. Uh, Whoa. But so then you really want to get out of your red jacket, right? And people even encourage you like order to size small so that's uncomfortable. So you can't wait to get out, you know? Um, yeah, what? For sure. Yeah, just like some subtle, like, why not, right? Why not like body shame someone and tell them that they should be a size smaller while you're at it? Oh my. Like, why not? <laughs> okay. So then what comes after the red jacket? So then you uh, build up your team to, depending on the promo, they, the promo they have going, you're supposed to need 10 to go into DIQ, but I think they've been running this like all in with eight thing for like ever, this limited time promotion that's been going for three years. Uh, <laughs> every six months they extend it. Um, so between eight and 10 people, depending on what greasy promo they're running at the time, uh, once you get into DIQ, you can then wear... You still wear the red jacket, but you can now wear a black shirt. You don't have to wear the, your, your, your gross pit stain spaghetti sauce white shirt no more. Now you can wear a black shirt underneath. Okay. Like underneath the, the red jacket? Underneath the red jacket. Yeah. So you can wear a black <laughs> skirt, nylons, closed toe shoes, black shirt, red jacket. That's the like... Big things happening. Feels, okay. That's official. Yeah. Now, like, is someone going to, like, boo you out the door if you're not wearing that exact thing? Like, I never wore that exact thing. I was always wearing whatever color shirt I wanted or, you know what I mean? I didn't, like, adhere to it all that closely. You definitely had to be wearing, like, a dress or skirt, though. Some directors wouldn't let you, like, up to the front of the room. Like, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let you get reco. They would, like, and it's, like, an official company rule. Like, you can't get on stage as a director if you're not wearing your suit. Like, you have to be in, like, attire or you're not allowed on stage for recognition. Yeah. So there is literally no, like there, there's just so much loss of identity yeah. that happens in an MLM, but especially yeah. when you'd make everybody dress in uniform. So there's no room for individuality. Yeah. Oh, and you're also supposed to wear a black beauty coat, like a Mary Kay branded beauty coat when you're like working, when you're having classes on your own, or if you haven't gotten into the red jacket yet, then you wear the black beauty coat. Like there's always a uniform that you're supposed to be wearing. Ew. We were told to wear our beauty coats when we're like out grocery shopping as like oh. a great way to find new leads. Yeah. Like just wear it all the time. Always wear it. Always so, be recruiting. <laughs> okay. So what's after the black shirt, red jacket? What comes after that? Okay. So then you're a director with the dubious privilege of wearing like a $400 suit. Like, do you want me to grab one? I have them in my closet. Yeah, right here. Sweet. Oh, well, here they come. You'll see. You'll <laughs> I want to see. see. Them all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Let's see this bad boy. Oh my goodness. <gasps> all right. So, this one's not from the company. The rest of these are. So there's this black one with like these zippers and like. That looks so hot. It's so hot. Are you kidding me? It's so hot. You're just dying. If I can find the actual dress. This one was really funny because I had like the full length dress and under the blazer, the armpits like literally turned to leather. <laughs> from wearing a blazer over it the whole time. How much so did that like, blazer cost, the black one? Yeah, like 400. Like, I think the, the blazer itself was like 250, and then the dress is like 100, <gasps> and then there's like a shirt. Yeah, there's like all of it. Oh, this is like, this is a real special one. This is, a, oh, I still have my pins on this one, actually. So this one, you know, looks like a couch. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people hated that one. And how much was that one? That, like all around 400, like every one of them. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. This isn't actually all of it. I have like a skirt for this one, I think. 
Oh, that yeah. looks so hot as well. They're all so hot. They're all wool suits. They're all wool suits. So yeah, and there's this one. It's a nice wool suit. Oh, here's like a complete suit that I actually still have. So this is like, you know, nice like like vinyl -y fish scale pattern, you know. <laughs> Everybody wants that. That's what everybody's looking for. And that one was 400 too? That was 400 skirt and everything? too. Yeah, around 350, 400, yeah. Yeah, oh so this my is like, God. I love the come, Like you can choose between like the dress or a skirt and a blouse. And then there's like three different blazer styles that you can choose from. So like, this is a navy suit. Now here's one where I actually still have literally all of it. This was my last suit. I've worn this like two times. I paid like paid $400 for this. But you got like your real, real hot wool pencil skirt and your paid like $80 for just this blouse. It's like really nice Reitman's looking. Oh my god. <laughs> it was like $55 American, so like 70 Canadian. And then, and then I opted for the long coat because, you know, we have cold winters. Oh my yeah. lord. This is actually isn't all of them. There's another one. There's a purple suit that I didn't find. <laughs> and don't forget about the pantyhose. <laughs> yeah, and then all the pantyhose. And then I would just go to like the dollar store and find because like I would put a run in them every day from just like my pantyhose budget. Like are you yeah. kidding me? Like, pantyhose are the worst. So Oh my gosh. And then when you're out and you get a, a run in your hose, it, like literally I was like a person carrying around an extra like pair of nylons. So that if I got a run in my hose, I could change them in the bathroom. Like Did you ever ca carry a like clear nail polish to oh, stop yes, the run? Absolutely. Oh for sure. Yeah. That was like the move. For absolutely. Holy cow. Yeah. That is a lot of money right there. Mm. That was like, what, mm. a couple thousand at least? Well, I have five suits and I paid like around between three and 400 for each of them for like the five suits I have. So, so you're supposed to wear those whenever you're demoing or like doing, like showing people product? So actually, no, you're not supposed to wear your suit for a skincare class when you're demoing product because that might be too intimidating. You wear your hundred dollar beauty coat. You wear the suit to recruiting like if you're having a career coffee you wear the suit if you're if you've already recruited somebody and you're like d discussing inventory options with her you would wear the suit for that uh any kind of like company training or anything like that you're always wearing the suit and we were expected i know that not a lot of directors necessarily do this but this was like so non-negotiable not an option for me with, with like the group that i was in um you're expected as a director to hold a meeting every single monday night you're that's so i would wear my suit every monday yeah <gasps> those suits get so much mileage oh my God. ours did yeah because we were expected to wear us lots of people in mary Kay wear their suits like twice but because we were holding so many events all the time because of the group that i was in like we were you know and they demand the moon, or whatever it is that we were doing yeah and they demand in those events you have to wear the suits oh yeah yeah whoa yeah the only one who wouldn't be in a suit is if you're like a brand new director and your order hasn't your suit hasn't come in yet but people were encouraged to order the suit before they even finished diq so that they'd have it hanging in their closet for inspiration and i know people who ordered the suit and never got to wear it <gasps> just like a clothing item that they yeah like they spent as much as they might on like a grad dress and they'll never even wear it one time and they were encouraged to get it because yeah. as a token yeah, to like inspire in your, them to hit right. Hang it in your office, you know, look at it every day when people come and ask what it's about. You can tell them this is like my suit I'm working my way into. I thought they wouldn't let you order the suit until you hit rank. Yeah, you can't, but your director will order it for you. Because <gasps> she can order it. Yeah. And you just pay them? Yeah. And see, it's like, it's like extra crappy of your director to do that too, because when you become a new director, you get a 20% coupon for your first suit, which isn't nothing. Like it's a $400, right? Like your 20% coupon saves you like a hundred bucks, which like your director doesn't have the coupon. She's not a new director. So then you become a director and you have this 20% coupon, but you've already got your suit. So look, whatever. So yeah. they urge you to order the whole suit. Yes. With oh, I got a lecture if I didn't order the whole suit. I didn't. Like, I just learned to do what I want and keep my mouth shut so that nobody could tell me what they thought of it. But And they know you that when you become a director, you get an $80 coupon almost out of the 20%. For yeah, 20%. Yeah, 20% coupon. And yeah. you, and you, and they just don't, they just tell you like, oh, just go ahead and order it for inspiration. Yeah, just so it can hang there and you can just not get this coupon that you'll get once you're done. That is so messed up. I know, and I don't know, like, the director doesn't, it's not like she gets anything for you ordering the suit. That's what, like, that was my next question. To, no, it's just to show them how much you believe in them, I guess, like. Wow, so what's the return policy with the suits? I'm trying to remember, because I did, 
it's actually good. Well, if you haven't worn it, like if it comes in, it's not your size or whatever. They like the company has a good, like we don't order them from Mary Kay. The company that we use, like the clothing company is called Twin Hill. Yeah, but I um, wonder if Mary Kay gets a kickback. It's a good question. You know, I don't know because yeah, they probably do. Like, let's be real. Somebody should, <laughs> somebody should investigate it. So the big question is why do they not let y'all wear pants? Not professional. I don't, you, haven't you noticed how women don't look professional in pants? <laughs> oh my God. This it's is... honestly so stupid. It doesn't even make sense. Like the amount of like discussion that goes on behind the scenes with new recruits who are like, really serious? Like it's so, why? Why is this the hill the company wants to die on? Well, I'll, I'll tell you why actually. I think it's like, the, it's that cult stuff again. It's like the differentiator, you know? It's like we wear white robes. We, you know, like every <laughs> cult has their own thing that makes them, it's like an identity thing, right? Yeah. And so uh, I, I think the more, out, un, the more unusual it becomes for a woman to work in a skirt or for a woman to wear nylons all day, it's like the more cult tactic it becomes to convince people that they need to. Because then it's like when you get up in the morning and you, like you choose to look sharp and you choose to look professional and you're like projecting the image of success. Uh, you like feel good about it, right? You're like, yay, go me, got dressed today. There, there's like a lot of reasons. Like they tell us, you know, you'll, you'll work more if you're not comfortable, like you'll work harder if you're, you know, cause you're working from home. So if you're sitting there in your pajamas, you feel, so like, you know, they'll tell you all the like, when you're in a skirt, it's like work time. And so then you, you it's like how you can have like a live work, a life work balance, right? I know if I'm in my skirt, I'm working. Uh, Wow. The whole like image thing. A lot of like crap talking people for looking bad when they're, you know, cause like a lot of people you'll go to a trade show or wherever and there's people representing their MLMs in like sweatpants. And so then we'd be like, look at, she doesn't look like a CEO of a company, you know, all of like that, like shitty bullying going on. Sorry, I'm trying not to cuss. Um, but all of that, all that general cattiness that happens, wow. I guess, with looking at how other women are showing up at trade shows to do their job and being like, well, so you know, we were told that MLMs get like a bit of a bad rap as not like being very professional. So if you dress like, you know, we were like overcorrecting perhaps by trying to be like so professional. Like I, and I mean, people do comment on it too. Like it's, again, it's like, it's fully a confirmation bias. Cause you go to the mall in like a skirt and heels and people are like, where do you work? You look like you work at a bank. You look like, like you look like you work somewhere important. Right. And so people treat you like you do. And it is true. Like people get the door for you more. Like, of course, if you like, go around looking like a 1950s cosplay like people will play along <laughs> like they'll get in on the gag uh wow. and so then it just makes you feel so sharp and so special and yeah it's just you know it's like the whole law of attraction thing once again I think you like dress like a CEO and then you'll become a CEO and you'll dress like you make the money and then you'll one day make the money and wow so it's just but it's, like why you can't do any of that in pants i think it's just control like i think that's really what it is is like the it's identity control thing. but you're also being forced to spend more money and it's mm -hmm. also a loss of individuality which in an mlm yeah. they do not want you to be an individual they want everyone being able to duplicate what everybody else does to grow the yeah. pyramid well so, and that's something we yeah. talk about is you want to be duplicatable like that was a thing i struggled right. with as a director remember i said like if i could just recruit someone like me because you have to figure out a way to be duplicatable so that everybody can do can do it. Which I think that with you, because you mentioned like a bubbly personality and whatnot, which you have, but I really truly believe that it's the size of one's network. So you must have had a good size network. I did. I really did. Yeah. I'm, I, I like people. You know, I, I pick up friends everywhere I go. And I, I um, you know, my first like recruit who started with like a good amount of inventory was somebody who I met through a friend going on a girl's hiking trip. And I knew that friend from like working at a restaurant or a hotel together 10 years ago. So I just I, like, I really, I like relationships. Like I'm a social person. I'm an extrovert. I like people. I have lots of friends. Yeah. Uh, and from those friends came, you know, like more contacts and stuff. Oh, totally. I remember saying to my recruiter, like, oh, I'm going to be so good at this. I know so many people. Cause like I had friends from my hometown. I had friends from Bible college. I had friends from university. I had friends from all the 15 different jobs I've had throughout my life. Cause I'm that person, right? The person who's always got a different job every year. And I so, was that person too. And now I'm like, don't talk to me. I don't need yeah. a friend. Like, I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. That industry it changes changed it. me. Me too. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I started saying, like, I don't need more friendships. Well, it just gets so exhausting because every new friendship you make, you're like, I got to turn this into a business contact. 
Well, you're told you know, that you're selfish if you don't offer them this. Yes, you are. You're not offering them this offer, awesome opportunity. They're not going to have what you have. So when you left, like I always say, I was a shell of the person I was when I walked away. And I still deal today with like the fallout of everything and just yeah. how it completely affected my confidence and my self-worth. How was it for you when you walked away? So like I stepped down as a director and they sent a couple of boxers to like my my uplines to the people who needed to know. But then that same day, I had a good friend whose car, whose Mary Kay car had come in and she was picking it up. And we always do like a big, like we all go with, you know, cupcakes and balloons and take pictures and make it like a big social media debacle. Um, every time someone picks up a car, you know, hashtag you can too. So, yeah. so uh, uh, I wanted to go to her car pickup because I wanted to be there for her, like as a gesture that I can still show up for her as a friend, even though we weren't both directors anymore. Uh, but no, she was the only one who knew, I think at that point that I had stepped down. And so everyone was just acting like I was still a director. Cause everyone thought I was like, no, like the penny hadn't dropped yet. I had sent all the stuff, but nobody had like heard or like, you know, checked their phones or whatever. Um, so that was awkward. Cause I was at a car pickup with this brand new car. Uh, and like, they wanted me to take pictures of it in front of it, you know, and like post it on their unit groups. And I was like, I don't really want to. And they're like, no, of course you have to. So like, it was just like I said, I love to see those pictures because like my eyes, I probably look like I'm dying inside. Just like oh. standing in front of this car, holding a whiteboard that's like, this is my next, you know, I'm working on earning this car, whatever. You know, all the social media things that people do, the pictures they take to post on their unit and on their oh, Facebook yeah. wall about the car they're going to earn and their friend who just did it and you can too. And I'm surrounded by success. And don't you want to join a winning team? <laughs> you know, that stuff, be a part oh. of it. You don't want to be left behind. Cringe. You know, all, all the stuff that you will post on your wall cringily for all your friends to roll their eyes at later. Oh yeah. Uh, I was there for those pictures, but I had already just stepped down and nobody knew. So. And what happened once everybody knew, did people stop talking to you or what went on? No. Okay. So I went dark. Like I, I was like, nobody talked to me. <laughs> like, I don't, I'm not, I am not available for comment. Um, my immediate senior voxed me back. Do you know what Voxer is? Yeah. It's like an app that, yeah, you would know. You can voice uh, record and yeah, send, it does like the, yeah. Yeah. It does the walkie talkie thing. Yeah. She sent me a voice memo back for your audience who may not know. And, and it was 100% positive. She was like, Oh, like you're still a part of our team. You're still going to be a part of what we're building. You're still a legacy director, you're still a part of our legacy, whatever. Like, uh, she was really, this was like marking a new, cause I had seen people step down and I had seen how they were treated and I was not treated that way at the time. I thought, Oh, this is probably just a new, um, you know, she had fallen in with some different people in the United States and they were trying to be like, not such assholes to people when they left and make the business look so bad. <laughs> uh, I even heard them say the phrase, um, this business is beautiful. Don't make it ugly when people leave or something like that. <laughs> So, uh, you know, there was like this growing idea that maybe we don't totally, um, like shun people shun. Yeah. Totally shun and block people just for leaving the business. But I, I think it's probably more like, like lots of things. Cause like they've, they noticed that if they were nice to people when they left, that they might come back. So I thought that maybe she was hoping that I would like come back. And so she didn't want to like burn that bridge. Um, I also think though now in retrospect that they're scared of me. I, I think that's the actual reason. It's like, it's like uncomfortable to say, cause I'm not trying to be like, look at how cool and intimidating I am. But I had other people like other directors be like, you know, she's intimidated by you, right? Like that's why she acts that way. And I'm like, I don't know why anyone would be intimidated by me. Like I'm such a Hufflepuff as a person. And I just like, I, I don't have it in for anyone. I'm not out to get anybody. I just want to like go through my life, like peacefully, happily, and like mind my own business. Like it's like generally who I am. But I don't feel like I want to go through life peacefully with this. I feel like I want to say what I experienced and for people to know the truth. And I think that they were probably scared of that. And like the more that I would just be like quiet and good, they were like happy to still treat me like a person and be, you know, like my friendships re remained intact. It was like, it was only once I was like publicly negative about Mary Kay that like things changed. <laughs> and <laughs> Which what I mean, happened then? Well, I, okay, so there's like a little bit that I kind of have to, I keep like dancing around this for no reason other than it's just a side story, but it's super important. So my financial situation was so bad because of Mary Kay that I couldn't pay my bills like ever at all. So and you so, were a director and you had the car, but you weren't able enough to earn or I was not earning to live. 
I did not have sufficient income to live. My husband's job, which does not pay well, was covering 100% of our living expenses. Like his, like he makes like $18 an hour. Like it is not like a fancy job. Uh, but Mary Kay gives you lots of like free stuff. And so you can like, you know what I mean? You get like a sparkly watch and you can like look all fancy all the time. So uh, no, my husband was like basic, but see, remember right before I started with Mary Kay, I had been a university student for four years. Like I got married right in the middle of university. So um, I always made enough money to cover my university tuition and like all of my own personal expenses for like me. And, and like, I'm, like my husband wasn't like paying my, my cell phone bill or anything like that, but he was working full time. He's always covered the mortgage and the gas and the groceries and like our basic living expenses. So when I moved on to the MLM, I don't think we noticed right away how much money I wasn't making. Cause it was just the same as our entire, like I'd never had an income like besides in the summer. You know, like we had literally never been like a two income household. So I think it just took us that long to be like, why the hell don't we have any money? Like, what is going on here? Of course, with me being so like self delusional about my finances. Um, so yeah, I was like pretending that I was making all this money. And I mean, I have so many embarrassing stories for you about all the money I was not making. But uh, I my phone bill, I would like not pay my phone bill for three months and then it would get cut off. Like this was like a thing I did all the time. This was like a regular way of life for me. So my phone bill would get cut off after not paying it for three months. Then I would like do a big push and sell some product to my customers and make enough money to pay off my phone bill or make enough money to pay off my whatever. You know, that's like why partly why I wound up with so much debt because I was never making payments on like, you know, I was like selling this and then taking 100% of my profit and using it to pay some important bill. And then the next time I needed to like make a, a production quote, I just ordered more product. And so there was not like the greatest of bookkeeping going on. I was just trying to like, keep, you know, my, my life rolling. So I would not pay my phone bill, it would get cut off. And then I'd sell the 300 and some dollars I needed to turn it back on. I'd pay it with the connection fee. And I'd go again for three months until I got cut off again. And then I'd sell enough to pay it, right? Because in those three months, all the product I was selling was going toward all these other bills that I couldn't afford that were stacking up on me constantly, right? So you were and robbing Peter interest. to pay Paul. Yes. And all the interest on all the credit cards that I had that were, you know, amounting more than I was selling in a month. So yeah, a lots of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Lots of tricking myself with all the money that I thought that I was making and I wasn't. And so my phone got cut off before I stepped down as a director. My phone had been shut down. And so I was like, well, who cares? <laughs> like, let's be real. I, now I don't have a job and I'm sitting in my house and I have Wi-Fi here and I can use iMessage. Like I could still text people, right? Like I could, anybody who had an iPhone, I could still text them and I could still uh, make phone calls through like Facebook Messenger and stuff. So I was like, I, who cares if I can't pay this? off right away and uh, then of course like I stepped down as a director and I just like went into like a full free fall like just as a human being I just you know it was like the last thing that I was kind of like trying to show up for in my life and so once I let go of that I was just like completely adrift and my mental health was so bad and there was so many crazy life circumstances like leading up to the two years before me stepping down as a director so by the time I finally like just was at my breaking point and I like couldn't fake it anymore I couldn't like I just like you said, was such a shell of who I was. So I stepped down, my phone wasn't necessarily hooked up at that time. Uh, I wasn't in a hurry to hook it back up because I didn't want to talk to anybody anyway. And then when I finally like pulled myself together enough to pay it off and get my phone hooked up and like be able to be a functional member of society, it turns out that like my phone company has a period where your phone can be cut off for only so long. And if you don't pay it up by then, your contract's terminated and you have to pay out the full contract. So that's what happened to me. I ended up getting enough money to, I'm sorry, this is like so boring. I hope you can cut it up or something. Cause it's like important. Like my phone no, was think, cut off I and I couldn't. Because it's a side that's not shown. And yes. I, I saw it a lot. People robbing Peter to, to pay Paul to project time, yeah. an image to the yes. world so that they could recruit. But behind the scenes, it was messy. Yes. Yeah. And I'm not, I don't mean to like get into all these details, but I guess like you need to know that I was letting my phone bill lapse all the time for three months at a time. I let it lapse for a little too long. My contract got terminated. So then I had to pay out my entire contract with my phone company. So now they needed like $800, which I had just barely scraped up 300 and now they needed 800 for me to get my phone hooked up. So I was just like free fall away, man. And I didn't have a phone bill for seven months, a phone for seven months. I just wow. was like, I'm a hobo now. Like nobody, uh, they, what, they gave away my phone number after like just having my phone cut off for a month. So then I oh. mean, like, you'll have to bleep this, but I was like, right royally fucked. Like, I was so incredibly screwed at that point because I had 
you know, thousands of dollars worth of inventory out with my now dead phone number on it. I had all, I had four years, five years worth of customer base, all with not my phone number. So the only way that I could reach out to people was, oh, and I didn't have a phone for seven months. I had like no way to reach out to people other than Facebook Messenger. Um, and more than anything, I didn't want to do it anymore. Like I didn't want to, of course I could have figured out a way to overcome it. I could have like, of course I could have messaged people on Facebook. I could have went out and got myself a whole new customer base with the same like cringy harassment tactics that I did the first time. Like I'm sure I could, absolutely could have done it all over again, like rose myself from the ashes and continued to be a big MLM scammer and continue to try to make this work. Like there absolutely, I could have done that. I'm so glad I didn't. I know people in Mary Kay would think that that's what I should have done, right? If I lost my phone bill, I should have just, uh, or if I lost my phone number, sorry, because I couldn't pay my phone bill, I should have just suffered. <laughs> should have just started all over again. Um, but no, I didn't, I, I just, I didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't want to warm chat people at the mall. I didn't want to make insincere friendships. I didn't, like, I just did not want to do it anymore. Remember I said that as a new director, I was really, like great at it and like everybody was starting with inventory and I had like all this production and this girl went into DIQ and it was like all yeah. happening it was crazy I'd show up for director meetings just stressed out and crying not knowing what to do like so much like blessings that I just like couldn't even handle it what ended up happening is all those people decided that they didn't like Mary Kay as much as I did and I didn't really know what to tell them about that because like I just knew what I knew I just I just did what I did and when they didn't they they sent their inventories back and what happens when people send their inventory back is the company does not lose any money. The director loses all the money. So my paychecks were getting, like, I wasn't earning any paychecks ever. My commission check, like, my, my, the, the commission checks that Mary Kay Bo directors are always bragging about that they're, uh, you know, the, all these numbers that they're making. Out of your commission check comes your car if you're not qualifying for it. Or if you're not, like, making, if you're not making car production every quarter, then that's going to come out of your commission check. And if you have anybody who sends their inventory back, that's going to come out of your commission check. And so both of those things were coming out of my commission check, like pretty early on. Like as soon as I got the car, I got the car and I had people start sending inventories back. Like both of those things happened immediately, right? Because it was all the people who, it was all the people who started with inventory, who I got them started with inventory and then their director broke away. And, and they had a director who like didn't even know how to do a career coffee because she'd never even, she'd never had the opportunity to watch me because we were so hell bent on like breaking some record or her being like the fastest director in the West or whatever the heck it is we were thought we were trying to do. You know, we just like, it was like, you hear the phrase house of cards and like, guys, that's the house of cards. Like that is what it is. There's no foundation. And it's just like, the bottom is so deep and dark and murky oh, and gross that you're sand, just building man. for the top. Yeah. yeah, it's sand. Like, so, it's so gross on the bottom that you're just looking up. You're just trying to, like, get to the next level, and it's built on nothing. And hearing that, that when you, when you, a, a rep sends product back with their, uh, was it 90%? Yeah, the 90% buyback. Yeah, so the company reimburses them 90% of what they invest. Okay, in. yeah. but the company doesn't lose any money. They take it. Out, out of the director's commission, out of the, out of the director's commission, commission which, yeah. whoo, yeah, that would incur, that would create an environment where you have so many uplines who are being encouraged to not have their reps send back products so they don't lose money, which would create a huge yeah. conflict of interest, I would think. And I would think the FTC would be interested in that. That's very interesting. You ended up keeping the car. I found myself at the end of my two year lease. I knew the company was going to call me the next day and be like, what are you going to do with the car? Like you got to bring it back or you got to buy it out. And so I had already sold our second family car. This was our only vehicle. Literally my husband needed it to go to work the next day so that like we could keep a roof over our heads. Uh, so, Oh, and remember like you, I don't have savings. I can't just go buy a used car. And my credit is absolute trash. Like I didn't even have a credit card before I started with Mary Kay. I signed up for my first credit card so that I could order inventory. Like I didn't even, I wasn't even living that credit life before Mary Kay. I was all, everything was like out of my checking account, cash only. Like I have never, uh, I, I never had a new car. I always bought used cars with my income tax reimbursement at the end of every year you know students get that big income tax you know and if I needed a new car I'd use it for that and then I drive that beater for five years like I never was a person with any kind of like debt or credit and then fast forward five years I'm like 30 some thousand dollars in debt between all of my credit cards and everything else 
and thirty thousand dollars from Mary Kay. Yeah, thirty thousand, thirty-five thousand was probably the worst. I think at the worst, I might have gotten up to like actually at its worst, I would have been at like about sixty thousand. That would have been like my worst. Yeah, the worst, the absolute, the most debt that I was in, it was like sixty. Yeah. And did so you were able to earn enough in Mary Kay to get down to thirty per thirty thousand dollars. No, 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 no. Uh, there, I no, I did not earn enough from Mary Kay to get down anything. I that I uh, I got another job. I quit Mary Kay and I got another job. Okay, so <laughs> you paid off thirty thousand on the credit card so far, and you still have another thirty thousand to go. Yeah. Yeah. That's like about where we're at. Yeah. I mean, I've been selling my inventory now, so I've been putting that, using that to make payments. Actually, like we just got a random check. I think it's just because we're so poor. Like <laughs> the government's like, y'all good. Like what's okay. happening? Because once I finally did my income tax, like we went four years with no government support at all because like, because Canada's got like some pretty good, like if you fall below a certain point, they'll just start sending you money quarterly. It's usually only a couple hundred dollars, but still. Yeah. Canada helps. has some social safety nets in place, which yeah. is nice. They should yeah, put it in is. citizens. Oh, you know what I heard is that uh, in Mary Kay, we felt like it was better that we didn't have, it, it would be better in the States with no social security nets because then people have to, they have to be successful. And that's why American directors do better numbers and why like American Mary Kay is so much more successful than Canadian Mary Kay because American Mary Kay, they don't have like healthcare or like any, you know, yeah. especially if they're like independent We struggle. Like, <laughs> Yay yeah, for they, Americans like, who struggle so they can join a pyramid scheme. Yeah, they so love desperate. it. They love that. Like, they're like, oh, there's just these people who are so like desperate to make it work. And that's why directors make so much money in the United States because it's so easy to scam all these desperate people who have sick children. <laughs> it is easy <laughs> you know? to scam desperate people, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Did, your, did you feel that there was a sense of uh, in the team that you were on, or even in the company where ordering product on credit cards was encouraged? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the worst I would say is I would give a personal story about feel bad for me though, because, <laughs> um, like, yeah, when we, we encourage people to put things on credit cards, my national, she ordered her, she started Mary Kay in the eighties, so I got to hear the stories of like the 24% interest rates of the 80s. And so, you know, she started with $5,000 worth of inventory at 24% interest back in the 80s. And then she was back at the bank another few months later, borrowing another 5,000 so that she could go to seminar. So like, these are like the expenses that she, you know, incurred. And this is, you know, so it was like always just like so normalized for me that people, you know, but then look where she is now, right? It's like the whole like rags to riches and like, oh, of course, you hear the story of all the people who didn't believe in her, but now look at her now, you know, take that everyone. So, mm. um, it, yeah, like that, that, all that spending money that you don't have, like that was so normalized to me to the point where at one point when I was like struggling to keep my unit and like every couple of months, I would just invest a few thousand dollars into inventory mm -hmm. uh, that I wouldn't sell probably just to like have my production quota so that I could keep my directorship for a couple more months. And it was one of those months where it was like the must, I had already decided, so I did this for a while. And then finally I was like, no more. Like I'm either, I'm not investing any more of my money. I'm either doing it or I'm not. And so I was at that point where I was not going to call the bank to increase my credit, whatever. I wasn't going to do it, but it was the end of the month. I was not, I had not made production. A national called and she's like, you know, what are you going to do? And I was like, well, I don't, I don't know what I can do. I mean, it's like, there's like an hour left before the month is over and I need like 3,000, 3,500 wholesale. Like I need like $3,000. So like, I don't, uh, I don't know what to do. And she was like, well, do you have a credit card? And I was like, they're all maxed out. And she's like, well, call the bank for an increase on your limit. And I was like, I can't do that. My credit is too bad. <laughs> But like, I can't believe that you, like, yeah, I, I had like, I got to the point where I would call the bank to raise my limit and they were like, no, no, you can't. You can't have more credit. You, your credit is terrible and you never pay us. Mm. So That's yeah. So, so this is all to say that, so my credit was pure trash. I was about to lose this car that, uh, I, and I couldn't afford to get, like, I wasn't going to be able to get qualify for good financing to get a new vehicle. And I didn't have any savings to buy an old one. So this mutual friend, like this friend of mine who was not mutual to us. So this friend of mine who was in Mary Kay, who was the director, uh, she had been in a similar situation. Surprise, surprise that I'm not the only one. She had been in a similar situation where she also got to the end of her two year lease and she also did not qualify for the car. And so she just bought it out. She bought the lease out. 
and she told me that like the price that they offered her was really good. And of course it is, right? I mean, you're sitting right there, you're like a buyer. It's got all these Mary Kay decals on it that they're going to have to pay to get rid of. Somebody's going to have to pay to send it to a different, you know, like, so you do get like a pretty good deal on buying it out. And so we did, my husband did, because again, my, my credit was way too terrible. And he actually had like, you know, an income, like even if your credit's bad, if you have a job, it helps, which I didn't. So we bought the car out. We, it was a, uh, so we pay monthly now I have to. okay but, but I paid monthly a car at before least. so I do have a vehicle yeah I mean and I'm not I, we like the vehicle like we're not I'm not bitter about it it's a Ford Focus it's like incredibly fuel efficient I love driving a hatchback in the city like parking's great you know like it's a good car I'm happy that I have it um but like it it wasn't like a choice that I made with any other option <laughs> you know right it, it's sad how just uh people join MLMs usually because they're desperate and then they leave and they are in such a worse position and it's what like they could have never imagined. So you have shared so much and I appreciate you sharing your story because I know it's not easy at all. In closing, what would you say to somebody who is thinking about doing it and sees all the shiny carrots dangling in front of them and that they could be a director and that they could do this, they could do that. What advice would you offer to somebody or even somebody who might want to walk away? It's, I would say that it's all smoke and mirrors. I would say your director could be as great as you think she is. She could be making the money that you think she's making. Like she could be, that could be true. It's probably not based on what I've seen for five years you know, it's probably not. And the more that I look at things with a clear head, the more I realize that there were places where I could have questioned things and I didn't. And now that I do, I I can see that there's an untold story, you know, like my national who had access to all this credit to have like, what was going on there? Well, if you do a little digging, it's just like anything with these MLMs, you know, with the founders, with anyone, you do a little digging and it's like, it's never, they never made the money the way they said that. I'm not making any accusations. This is just based on observations and thoughts that I've had. But I do think that people aren't making money in the MLM the way they say they're making money. It's probably like, maybe it's an inheritance, you know, and then, you know, you you inherit some money from a a grandparent perhaps, and then you use it to make yourself look super successful. Maybe you invest in a ton of inventory and then you have a car and people think you actually have a team, but in reality, you just spent your whole inheritance. Like something like that could happen, you know, like there's, it's always something like what I, I, I find whenever I look at these top earners in Mary Kay, if you look at like, if you do the digging, I don't, but I read the bloggers who do. Like, there's always something. There's always something else there to explain where the money came from. And that's the real problem is that if you're in Mary Kay or an MLM and you're really believing that the success that's being modeled to you is real, like, that's the problem is it's not. Like, the money came from somewhere else. They're not selling as much as they say they're selling. They're not making as much as they say they're making. They're not living the life that they say they're living. And so, whether or not you, believe me, make decisions as though, make your decisions as though I'm telling the truth. Like ask yourself when your director with her like sparkly bracelet and shiny high heels and pink car is telling you, do what I do and you'll be where I am. Like maybe question how she got there though. Did she really recruit the people and sell it? I don't know. Something I wanted to share, I hope uh, it shouldn't be like too long, but this is just something that I think people need to be aware of. I found out that there was a director in uh, my city who was encouraging her recruits to just 90 sell their product on marketplace so that they didn't like sell it at half price sell it at what they paid for it so that they didn't 90 percent it and the reason that i'm mentioning that is like think about there's this director who's going to like walk up to a girl and say hey you can sell this product at 50 percent profit look at all the money you're going to make this totally works and then that same day she's going to turn around and have a conversation with this different recruit who's been here for three months who's not doing too well who wants out And rather than giving that girl like the pass to return her inventory for the 90% that's going to come out of the director's paycheck, instead, she just says, just sell it on buy and sell like nobody will, nobody will know. When I found that out, like that is so incredibly sick that you're telling this new recruit that she, like she really believes that she's going to sell this product at full price. Like that's the thing I think that people need to realize as a recruit. And this person that I'm talking about, this whole like treacherous situation aside, I would I would sign off that she's a good person. Like if you were to walk up to me, Mary Kay aside and be like, this person, like, do you, do you think she has good morals? Do you think that she has good judgment? Do, would you see her as a genu- generally good person? And I would say, yes, like she's a generally good person. But the things that I see this person doing are just like reprehensible. And I don't even know how you justify it in the MLM. Like how do you have people in your unit and you're telling them to sell their product on buy and sell 
immediately undercut how, how how can you in good conscience recruit a new person when you're telling your existing recruits to undercut the new person like the director's not worried she's already got her customer base she's already living off her commission checks she's not living off product sales directors aren't living off product sales so they're running around flashing this image of success convincing these people to join their teams bullying people this is what i experienced so nobody was mean to me until i started selling my product on marketplace and then i had people in my inbox like i'm talking asking me about my integrity and telling me that i was responsible for the product when i ordered it and that, that i know that this isn't right and you know the interesting thing is that the only people who had negative feedback for me about posting my product on marketplace were directors a lot all the consultants who were friends of mine who looked up to me as a director who are still who were still consultants they were all fine with it i talked to them like they asked me I, I shared my reasons i haven't blocked everybody on mary kay or in mary kay on facebook like i've been told to that i should just block everyone and then they can't bother me um but like what about the people who like don't who want to hear my experience like what about you know i just feel like i didn't block them to pretend that i was successful so why would i block them to tell the truth like they you know what i mean if they want to hear the truth they can hear it if they don't, they can block me, but I'm like, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna like say what I've experienced and be mm -hmm. honest about it. I'm not gonna like go and try to target people's actual recruits, but I'm not gonna pretend that I had a great experience and that I didn't lie about most of the things I was experiencing at the time because I felt right. like I had to, like, I'm gonna be honest about that. Right. And I guess new recruits or existing recruits need to realize that your director probably isn't. And you probably think your director is a good person and she probably is, but she's probably doing horrible things, horrible things to keep her directorship. Hmm. And she's probably playing with a different set of rules than you are. Right. So when you're looking at her and wondering why you can't get to where she is, it's because she's playing with a different set of rules than you are. You might have more integrity than her. You might be less willing to place orders on other people's accounts on their behalf to make them look like real people selling product and not just another version of you. So, wow. It's just like, yeah, like if you're looking up to your, your director, she probably wishes that she wasn't your director either. I, so I guess that's what I would say is it's all kind of a big lie. It's a lot of smoke and mirrors. A lot of smoke doesn't, and mirrors. It's, doesn't, a very it's not how it looks. Yeah, no, it's not how it looks at all behind the scenes. Yeah. And even for people who who were able to make money and live off of it, like I was, it's still like mm -hmm. I walked away for a reason. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, yes. so. Yeah. I thank you so much, Elle, for sharing your story. Where can people find you or do you want people to find you? <laughs> yeah, I do. So I do have a YouTube channel. Uh, the channel name is Reckless Mermaid. Uh, you can find it and check it out. I actually recorded a video like a month ago about my experience. I just haven't livened it yet. I haven't published it yet because I, I got a little scared. Uh, but because Mary Kay's legal team is very intense. They like to really brag about their legal team and what they're going to do. But I've been... We'll see. I'll let you guys know if they do anything about me doing this interview, if they can figure out who I am. But that was like a big reason I just don't want my real identity is like, the sooner they figure out who I am, the sooner they can start harassing me with legal letters. And I don't want that. Okay. But you're okay with me saying <laughs> yes. L and... Yeah. L is, like, is perfectly fine. You can identify me that way. It's a nickname. It's not like my legal name. So. Okay. Okay. And it's showing that. your face. And then once again, yeah. disclaimer, this is just your experience. It's what I thought. From... It's what I heard. It's just what I thought. Yep. That's it. Well, thank you. And you stay strong because I'm really proud of you for sharing your story. I know it's not easy. Thank you so much for having me and doing this interview. Hey.